And real quick, last thought, couple words, it's finally Maslin Week. It's a big week. It's a big week, uh, you know, for our program. It's a big week for our community. It's a big week, you know what I mean, for, you know, for, for just football, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's a, a rivalry that started 100 years ago, and uh, it was a, you know, a wonderful opportunity to, to get them back on the schedule. Um, and they're coming here at, to the, the best stadium in Ohio. Uh, so it's, it, I don't see nothing less than a, a phenomenal football game between two good programs. Thanks, Coach. It's the Black Swarm Podcast, baby. We're raw. And welcome to the week three edition of the Black Swarm Podcast. Hank Pipe here with Rob Antonell. Big win over Glen Oak last week, 35-7. to Let's just get right into it, man. What are your thoughts from the game? Uh, I think it was a good win, of course. Um, mad that... You know, Glen Oak scored those points at the end, of course. But uh, I think in general, a good bounce back game for us. Wasn't the cleanest, most beautiful game in the world. Of course, there's thing, some things that we could clean up. But I think it was a much needed win. Glen Oak's not the best team in the world. But we got to go out there, um, practice a, new, a few things, get better as a team. And I think that's kind of the step we needed. Yeah, definitely uh, kind of a get right game after a little stumble out of the gate. Um, unfortunately, I had to watch it from up at base in Youngstown, so I didn't get to be at the game live. That always sucks. Honestly, was kind of dreading having to watch it from uh, – okay, this is going to sound mean, but I hate watching the replays from the you know the high school like production team. That being said, I was part of that production team at one point. I know the entire operation that goes on behind it. I know how it's held together by a bunch of kids that are just like, okay, who wants to do announcing? I'll do it. Okay, who wants to do a uh, camera? I'll do it. There's no, you're a good announcer. You're going to announce. You're a good camera. You're going to be the camera guy. It's just whoever wants to do it. And listen, like for it being run by a bunch of children, yeah, pretty good production value. That being said, I prefer the actual like Spectrum production that you know the cable company put on. And with that being said, the announcers of the game still sucked. Really? Oh my god, it was god awful. Like that was like once they kind of got going and got in a rhythm, they had that announcer voice, so mm -hmm. it like sounded good if you didn't pay attention to what they were saying. Yeah. But holy hell, were they retarded? I mean, oh, I mean that wouldn't be a good production, yeah. Um. Let's see here. They kept calling Trell Harston. Lots of uh, Liber out there, you know. Mm. Good to see number 10 out there catching, you know, returning kickoffs and all that stuff. Uh, da, 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 what else? Oh, apparently the running back for Glen Oak is the next Barry Sanders because they would not shut the fuck up about that, even though we held him to, like, 20 rushing yards total, yeah. I think. And, yeah, just all around – they, they it was not good i would have vastly preferred listening to whatever high school kid raised their hand and said i'll do it but that being said the camera angles it seemed like they had you know like five or six cameras going and were pretty good thank you god they like for the most part got the all 22 film in there mm -hmm. i've been going back and we're trying to start a little film room action here at some point and Going back and looking at the WHS TV, like, recordings of the games, man, do they like to zoom in on pretty much just the quarterback in the box. Yeah, I mean, it's been like that forever, though. I mean, as long as I've been watching recordings my whole life, it's always been super zoomed in where you can't see anything that's going on with the play. You can only see the ball. Yeah, that's probably why I'm griping so much right now, just having to, like, fight through that and having an idea of, like, oh, we can – this play right here, you know, like, I remember watching this live. You'll be able to see – and, no, you can't see shit. Yeah. But, so, 
I guess we just treated that first few minutes there like uh, my event sesh. I feel a lot better now. Overall, big fan okay, of good. what we do. Yeah. Um, Get it off your chest? Yeah. Feel I feel better? I feel better now. All good? We're good. Okay. Keep doing what we're doing, guys. Again, as a former student of Teleproductions WHS, love it. I just understand the background. Um, But getting right back into it, yeah. So we did, 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 you know, we got the kickoff, ran right down the field, got down to yep. the goal line, scored three times from the goal line. All three, you know, plays, it was somebody scored. Yeah. I mean, a consistency throughout the game, I think, where the refs being bad at spotting the ball. Um, you could have just stopped it bad. <laughs> uh, I, but one thing that I noticed consistently was the spots were always a little bit off i mean not always but like once you get past like three four or five times where you think they're not spotting it great mm. uh, that's that's a pattern so um you know like you said scoring three times we got credit for one of course yep but we scored the two before that as well um and then just throughout the game i think there's plenty of times where we had a few extra yards that got taken away or going well, got a few extra yards um from their plays so I mean, it's only a couple yards, but you know that could be a huge difference in yeah. the right circumstance. Um, overall, I guess the rest of it, let you know, we kind of, we kind of ran the game for the most part. Like yeah, that was absolutely that was definitely us in control pretty much mm-hmm. the entire time. Uh, defensively, we came out, gave up a couple plays. It seemed like Glen Oak really wanted to run that ball control offense. They were staying in the heavier personnel, which it's weird to say heavier now because, like, you know, 20 years ago that was just base personnel, tight end, fullback, running back. Um, when they, It seemed like they didn't want to get into four wides at all. They only went to that when they had to, and when they did go to it, they couldn't really do anything. It, Our front seven just dominated, man. Pringle um, – he seemed to be all over the field. Yeah. Like, just making play after play after play. One of the announcers said uh, in a how-do-you-do-fellow-kids moment, Pringle is built different. <laughs> yeah, I, Pringle was all over the field making a lot of plays. Um, Him and Fair both. Yeah. Uh, the two inside backers were just all over the field making a lot of plays, a lot of plays in the backfield. Uh, just a great showing by them. And I think the thing that's going to go – unnoticed from that concept is what makes a linebacker's life a lot easier is when your defensive line is doing their job you beautiful bastard i was just gonna say that yeah there it is so uh I, of course some of our defensive linemen made big plays also and, th- and you notice those and you're excited about those but every time one of those linebackers goes clean you can thank a defensive lineman for doing his job mm-hmm. eating up double teams um just making it harder for the offensive line on the first level can't even make it to the second. Mm-hmm. And I think that's even more impressive considering how much just straight up three down defensive line we've been running. You know, if you look at like our base defense, it's it's a three down under ish front to where you got, you know, your nose guard is to the strength of the defense. Your three tech is actually bumped out to a four eye on the backside. You still got your end on the strong side, but your our jack back or the Obi, he's back up off the line and not necessarily rushing with his hand down in the dirt every play. Mm-hmm. Just you got only having those three linemen up front, but still being able to let the second level defenders wreak the havoc that they do really speaks to the talent that we got right now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, like you said, our front seven dominated, uh, of course, early in the game. A couple of plays, Glenno got some yards, but as the game went on, more and more dominant, completely suffocating Glenno's offense. Uh, one of those plays that stands out in my mind, well, two of them really, was both made by the corner. Um, ah, I'm blanking on his name right now. Come on. Welch? Yes, Welch. First getting burned on that, was it a... Jet sweep double pass or like a halfback pass, some Something kind of like deal. Jet sweep or yeah. toss, but yeah, I mean, some, some kind, kind of double deal. pass. Where the running back, or I'm sorry, where the wide receiver that Welsh is guarding, you know, kind of walks, fakes like he's blocking, and that just takes off. Yeah. And tough to see him get burned like that, but I will take a pass interference over six points any day of the week. Yeah, in the moment, uh, it wasn't a good throw. So it <laughs> yeah. probably wouldn't have mattered, but in the moment, you know, we all saw him bite, get burnt, and then 
just immediately turned around, recovered, made a play on the receiver, which in that circumstance is probably the correct play. Yeah. Uh, you know, we'll give you 15 yards, which we did, um, but you're not going to burn us with that double move. Mm-hmm. If you can get to him, get to him. I mean, if you're an elite player, maybe you can try to turn around and find the ball, but that, that's such a tough play. Uh, so a lot of those times, yeah, you just go grab the receiver, throw him out of bounds, whatever. Yeah. You know, you're not catching this. That, that's kind of the whole point of it. You know, 15 yards, but no touchdown. Of course, the, the quarterback threw up an end-over-end kickoff punt. So <laughs> <laughs> I think he underthrew the receiver after the interference still. So, but, hey, that's not Welch's fault. No, absolutely <laughs> not. Um, so, yeah, you know, you get burnt. It happens. Double move, double play. I mean, go make up for it. Pass yeah. interference is okay in that situation. Yep. Take that every time. Yeah. Don't get burnt. If you do, don't give up six. Yeah. We didn't give up six. Um, and then a few plays later in that drive, I think, quarterback was scrambling, doing his best Lynn Bowden impression, and l- turns back around, turns the corner, looks like he's gone for at least 30 yards, and Welch just comes flying in like a bat out of hell, takes yeah. out his ankles like any good cornerback does in an open field tackle, and saves at least you know 30 yards. Yeah, it seemed like it was a really big play, and I think he still gained, like, I don't know, 10 yards on that or 15 hey, yards on yeah, that. Yeah, he gained, but, like, 8, 10 yards. But it was, like, third and 30. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, absolutely came up, made a great play, um, put, kept them in a long-distance situation, kept our defense in a good spot. So, coming up, making an open field tackle, great play. Mm-hmm. Um, other stuff that stood out to me. Oh, we talked about it before, but uh... – the announcers, another thing they wouldn't shut up about is Scott Garcia is confirmed back at the helm of Glen Oak. So that's settled. I know we had like a <laughs> yeah lengthy conversation on who the hell their head coach was last week. Yeah, and you were so convinced there was no turnover over there at all. I've been wrong before. I'll be wrong <laughs> again. I'll probably be wrong in the next five minutes. I mean, in your defense, he has been there for a long time. Yeah. And he only stepped down as coach. He stayed on as the athletic director yeah. and then missed it and then fired the guy and said, it's me. I'm the coach again. I, d- I don't know. I have n- That part, I don't know. It's a weird dynamic. It's like, ah, this guy's just not getting it done. And then pulls like a, you know, like, oh, who's going to be the best? Okay, let's let's hire, a, you know, somebody that really needs to take the reins over, yeah. bring Glen Oak where it needs to be. Eeny, meeny, <laughs> miny, bo. Well, all right. I mean, I don't know how true it is, but I remember hearing a rumor when he stepped on the first time was like the only reason he stayed on for an extra year is because he didn't think they were going to be very good that year and he wanted to save the new coach the beating that was going to happen that year. That still happened anyway the next year? Yeah, well, I think they were hoping to... Mitigate that? Yeah. Like, all right, I'll take the first one. (laughs) And hopefully we can get the ship moving in the right direction. We'll bring in a new guy. He doesn't start his career with us. Yeah. With a one and nine record. So <laughs> I'll eat that bullet and then we'll move on from there. But you know, that didn't last long. He's he's back as their head coach again. And that might not be a true story anyway, but Hey. That's us here at the Black Swarm Podcast. Nothing but facts. Yeah. Um The Hartson fumble, the first one. So you went to the Booster Club, yep. and you kind of mentioned it in the group text. I I will tell you from the TV angle, it literally just looked like he did, decided not to take the handoff. Like there didn't appear to be any sort of read element to it. You know, a quarterback slaughter, he was just going to hand it off to him. Mm-hmm. Hartson just dropped it. And then I don't know if he was just planning to get subbed out anyway, but the next drive we have the football, he's in his mandatory timeout as any running back that fumbles the ball goes into and then he's back in the next series, and we just keep it moving. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I'm not entirely sure. I noticed that after that play was over, Trell came off the sideline and like just as if he would the end of any play, whereas Lennox and Slaughter, when they came off the sideline, they were getting coached up. Trell didn't really get coached up at all, so it made me immediately think, like, okay, this wasn't a Trell thing. This was a either Slaughter or Lennox or Slaughter and Lennox thing because um, they're the ones getting coached up right now after a fumble, which seemed to be not on I, Trell. Yeah. So just made me wonder, like, what the dynamic with that was. You know, why are they why are they the ones getting coached up here? Um, made me think it was a little bit more than just Trell fumbling. 
Okay, he didn't talk about that at Booster Club at all. Uh, I think it had something to do with um, had to do with Linux and Slaughter, not Trail. Okay, well, whether or not he was planned to get take the next drive off, it looked like to me he was in timeout. So anyway, uh, moving along, you know, first half should have. What do we go in there? Fourteen nothing. Definitely should have went in there. Twenty one bop. Yeah. Uh, come out the second half, just in total control of the game. Somehow the defense came out even more swarming than they were in the first half. Didn't give up any ground. Offense seemed to kind of find a rhythm a little bit. Scored on. It was good to see we have the fake screen and go off of the bubble screen that we installed this year too, not just the now screen, which we've been running for years. And then just kind of seem to do what they want the rest of the game. Um, any other impressions from that at all? Uh, I think our defense was absolutely dominant. I, mean, I think we came out and Glenn Oak got the kickoff in the second half, right? Yes. And immediate three and out, I think loss of yards total for the drive. Um, I don't remember what our first offensive drive was. Was it the that was the, the bubble touchdown? screen? Yeah, bubble screen, fake screen, touchdown. And I think we came back out on D and again just completely shut them down right away. So we saw signs of it in the first half, but there was a few times where we lost contain. Quarterback was scrambling, got outside of us. Um, QB draw. I think that was in the first half. Mm-hmm. So there was a couple of big plays that they had, but in the second half, it seemed like we completely took that away. Uh, guys stayed in their lanes a little bit better, held the backside contain. So how many times did we see quarterback roll out to his left, get pressured, and there's just no chance of going back to the right now? So uh, I like that. Another thing that I noticed in the first half, not sure if I noticed it in the second half, uh, there was a couple of times where on that rollout we had a edge defender that – seemed confused on if he should go rush the quarterback or if he should drop. He's kind of on the line, running down the line, Mm -hmm. and then at the last second, like, specifically once, it looked like, and in this exact situation, they had a crossing route or, you know, a shallow route that was already covered. And this guy, instead of attacking the quarterback, dropped. And I think there was a couple of times where they were stuck in the middle of, am I supposed to go get the quarterback or am I supposed to drop? And I think in the second half, I, I never noticed that. So I don't know if that was just a quick coaching tip. You know, hey, when we're in this coverage, like you have, you got the role. Yeah. Or you have the, you know. So I think there's just small, not miscommunication, but like questioning. The player's questioning if, you know, mm-hmm. am I supposed to drop here? Or am I not? And at that point, I think if you're already like on the line of scrimmage, one yard deep, and you see that. Go for it, kid. Go for it. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, and definitely don't start going for it and then turn around and go try to find your coverage. You know, I, no, but I, I think like, in the second half that was completely mitigated, so not an issue. Yeah. But that was just something early that I noticed. And it, it could have been a weird situation. I don't know about, but uh, just one of those, like you see it happening in front of you and it's like, oh, just go get him, go get him. Like everybody's covered, go get him. And they're slow playing it because they're not sure. Mm. But I think that got reconciled. So wasn't worried about that. I think. And yeah, in the second half, everybody just kept their lanes. Yeah. Got pressure on the quarterback pretty quick. We were blitzing a lot as well. And uh, in the back half, everybody was doing their job. So quarterback didn't have a chance to get a ball out. A couple sacks, a couple big losses. Yeah, love to see it, man. Black Swarm, baby. A um, couple other things I wanted to touch on. Terrell had another fumble in the second half, but this one, it's probably the least bad fumble you can have. Because the TV angle, the camera on the sideline caught it perfect. This defender, like, didn't even attempt to tackle Trell. He just grabbed onto that ball for dear life and did not let go. And we all saw what happened. It's not like Trell was holding out there like he was doing his best with Sean McCoy impression, like just a loaf of bread. He had it high and tight. You know, probably if you're being real nitpicky about it, like get it up a little bit higher. But let let him be a dude. And... That defender made a hell of a play, just death gripped that ball and r- managed to rip it out of there. Like, you don't want to see a fumble, but that's one of those you watch film like, yeah, I get it. Yeah. You know, it's like you want to tell the kid be stronger, but you'd, you know, 175 pound defender holding on to the football that you have one arm on, you're probably not winning that battle. Keep her moving. 
Yeah, I mean, fumbles happen. Mm-hmm. You just want to try to limit them. Um, <sighs> all right, receiver. I, uh, I, I don't want to stand here, like, you know, sit here and shit on a kid and his performance, but okay, <laughs> we, we need to objectively look at, we gave Banks a lot of opportunities, a lot of one-on-one balls, and he didn't perform what we would like him to, I guess. Like, I don't know how to quite talk about this right now. Mm-hmm. One, because I never played receiver, and two, because, again, I... We're not trying to, you know, badmouth a kid here. Like, he just – he had a bad game. I would like to get your insight on that because strictly from my perspective, mm-hmm. I'm stuck somewhere between when, like, he gets a ball thrown his way. It's almost like I don't know if he's not trying or if he's trying to figure out how to jump for the ball and he can't figure it out in time. Yes, I mean, this is something we addressed last week. Because there was a time or two in the Moeller game where I thought he had a shot of going up and getting a ball Mm -hmm. and didn't come down with it or mistimed it. That carried over again this week. There was a couple of times where you would have liked to see him go up and, you know, make a play on the ball. It is tough because there's a few times, specifically the one that was in the back of the end zone. Um, in the first half, yeah, I don't know if it was a smash corner okay. or something. But it, so it wasn't like in the corner. I can I can walk you through that right now because yeah. we ran that play twice. Um, lined up in trips with him as the number three. You got two guys, the two outside guys running underneath routes, and it looked like he was running a corner out to get to some yeah. trips variant of smash. So if I remember correctly, it wasn't really in the corner though. It was more vertical than that. He wasn't at the pylon. It seemed that okay, that's well, how maybe. it appeared to me on the okay. TV. Um, yeah. That one specifically, I remember thinking that it was in a, a really weird spot for him because I think if you stay in stride, it's an over the shoulder catch mm-hmm. in the back of the end zone. I think if you're a step quicker or a step ahead of where you were, I think you have a chance to then go up and high point it. And I think he was just kind of stuck in the middle. And if I remember correctly, it just dropped. There, was, there wasn't really a play on it. Yeah, it just, it like, just kind it, of dropped. It looked like he just kind of like started to put his hand up. and then it just. So it was like kind of in the middle. But, I mean, that's, that's what we're looking to see. Mm-hmm. You know, it, you're not going to get all of them, of course. No, but, it's, it's a 50-50 ball for a reason. But I think that there have been, in the first two games, three, four, four, maybe five opportunities. Where I, I think we talked about it in the group text in the Glen Oak game. It was at least four. Four for the season. No, that, four that for game, Glen Oak. I, I think I meant four for the season. Oh, okay. But opportunities where you would have liked to see him go mm-hmm. up and make a play. And, you know, we're holding kids accountable based on what we believe their ability is. Yeah. I th- believe that if you're 6'4", run the, what I mean, fast. You're, you're fast. Fast. I don't, I don't know what your 40 is. <laughs> um, I know you're a track star. Everybody talks about Lennox because he's probably the fastest kid in the state. But Banks is also a track star. Don't get it twisted there. He's fast. And you're committed to a D1 college. Hell of a basketball player. So it's not, I mean, there, there's athleticism all over here. Like, and it's proven. He's shown flashes. Like, when he looks like a receiver, yeah. he looks like that D1 receiver mm-hmm. that we need him to be. You know, he made that one catch in the Moeller game, just that reached out over the shoulder Beautiful. in stride. Not but, an easy play. No, not one bit. Like, And it's not just him being a bigger body than the guy defending him. It was like him being a D one receiver. Absolutely. So like, that's when we talk about, we see flashes like that. And like you said, we're holding him to that higher standard and at least holding Tim to what seems like the expectation of the coaching staff and his players. The fact that he keeps getting some of these like one-on-one balls Mm -hmm. and the fact that slaughter keeps throwing him 
some of these one-on-one balls because we got I'm going to talk about later um, some of the offense we run is matchup based and that's where a lot of these jump balls come into is Slaughter just likes the matchup let me throw it up to my 6-4 D1 guy and see what he can do yeah I think something else worth talking about there um, and we briefly talked about it during the game uh, whether it's true or not is a different story but we noticed in the second half, or at least later throughout the game has gone on, after these plays we're talking about have already happened, for the first time all season, Slaughter has kind of left these high arcing passes short. Mm-hmm. And we were wondering if, did he just miss them short? That happens. Or was there some kind of thought process or communication where... Because every time that we've missed a shot with Banks, it's been a yard too far. Mm -hmm. It's always dropped right past him. And so we were wondering if they're intentionally throwing it a little bit shorter so he can time it up and go make the play. You know, he's 6'4", a hell of an athlete. That should be an easier play, you know, going up to get it rather than trying to in between, you know, is it in stride? Do I? So taking the thought process out of it, making a little bit more natural just going up and get it. Was that intentional, or did we just leave them short? I don't know, but there's, I think, two instances in the game where they were both short. One of them was an interception. That one was definitely too too short. But The interception happened on that same kind of trip smash play, lining him up as a three and kind Mm -hmm. of that red zone corner route. Um, And, yeah, it it did seem like watching the replay, it was – shorter than you would like it to be yeah and honestly i think these are some of the growing pains you're going to be going through with Mm -hmm. a sophomore quarterback that i don't really remember him throwing banks one-on-one balls last year yeah so it's them still trying to find a rhythm Mm -hmm. trying to get in sync and once they do like i think that can be a dangerous combo you know we, yeah, I mean, we've seen the opportunities. Mm-hmm. So you start connecting on them. Absolutely. And we've seen what can happen with that in the past. You know, I'm going to go back to my Trey Morgan example. Uh, the one-on-one ball king. You just throw him a jump ball, he's going to go up and get it for you. And I think that's what Banks can be. I see all the potential there, seeing the flashes of it. Just go out there and play ball, kid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, that was my putting on my receiver hat for you there thank you um i can't give you much answer to it besides it is tough yeah when you get in betweeners so maybe they've just all been very in between or just a little overthrows i mean you never know just Mm -hmm. one way or another we want to see that percentage go up yeah right so get me up to it being an actual 50 50 ball Mm mm-hmm and then we can go from there. Yeah. Uh, other stuff from the game. Let me run through my notes real quick. Oh, God. I forgot. Another thing that the um, announcers just... So, Ange Salvino goes down, makes a hell of a tackle on a kickoff. Yeah. And then the announcers immediately started talking about how the long snapper always gets a free release on punts, and that's why he was in a position like that to make that play. I forgot about that until I read my note, and that's just another thing I want to bitch about right now because that's what I'm turning this podcast into is my own therapy time. Uh, da, 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 da. So lots of inline tight end formations from us uh, between Moeller and Glen Oak, something we haven't run – necessarily a lot of and in fact i don't remember seeing our base offense formation you know the two right wide receivers one side one to the other fullback running back i don't remember seeing that at all against uh moeller and then against glen oak kind of saw little bits and pieces here and there and then the second stringers came in and that's all we ran so that tells me that's still our base formation it's just the personnel that we have. We can play around with the stuff more, and we're, you know, our, we're branching out more, seeing what we can do, trying to put our guys in the best spot available. Just kind of an interesting thing for me. Um, 
And run a little bit of a GT counter, something I haven't seen since 2020, I think. We ran it off that fake jet motion early in the game. That's another kind of run concept that it's a weird one to add because, you know, we run so much power, we we run so much counter F, it would make sense to have it, except you're baking your tackle because he's now the puller leading through the hole. You're making him learn an entirely new technique that he's not doing anywhere else in the game except that one play. And the fact that we can successfully run that, or at least that's what it looked like because we gained, like, I think five, six, eight yards on it, uh, speaks to what our line can do. You know, we were talking about earlier how many different run concepts do you have, and that coupled with how pretty decent our pass pro looked through Glen Oak as well. I, You know, I'm feeling a lot better about our line than I did going into the season. Yeah, I mean, there's been some moving parts back there. Um, like we talked about, you're always trying to figure out what combination works best, um, who's the healthiest, what works with what you want to do. Uh, I mean, in general, our line isn't as big as it has been in years past. So maybe that also changes, you know, what you can run or what works best with your personnel. But, I mean, in general, you work with what you got, work to their strengths, Um and the fact that you can change it up, like you said, I mean, it's a testament to their coachability and, you know, our ability to change what we do or add wrinkles in that work with our personnel. Yeah. That's about all I got on the Glen Oak game. Uh, you got anything else you want to add? I think we touched on about all of it. Oh. Special teams. Yeah. Uh, kickoff return, still doing a hell of a job. Yes. I think we were averaging like 30-some yards a return. And that surprise onside kick mm-hmm. right after we scored that first touchdown. Yeah. That, that screamed to me something we saw on film of like probably those the, those guys, those return guys over there mm-hmm. immediately turning their back on kickoff. We saw a hole. We took it. And now that's something teams are going to have on – teams are going to have on film to have to prepare for to be ready for and that's probably going to make their return team a little more hesitant when that kick goes yeah so i mean in real time i saw the way it came off the kicker's foot and it looked like it was coming really short right from the stands and i saw their entire return return team just retreating as fast as they can, having no clue where the ball was. And that was my initial reaction, and we went over there and picked it up easy. Watching film, that that's exactly what happened. Their entire <laughs> second line just turned around and full sprinted, had no clue where the ball was. No clue. I, I mean, so yeah, I mean, maybe that's something that they were doing, um, and we knew it. I mean, of, of course we probably had an idea yeah i don't know if we had that idea like <laughs> there's a 95 percent chance we're gonna recover this I, I don't know if we knew it was that high of a percentage but yeah i mean going with you said like other teams have to prepare for it it's not like a new concept that we have never done before we've done pooch kicks down the side a lot um you know plenty of times that's a staple for us mm-hmm. is kicking it down the sideline usually not short like that that's usually been our go-to on but kick yeah, a little push on the side. A, mm-hmm. a short one, yeah. I mean, it's tough because there's not a whole lot of people out there. So unless you have the kid that's smart enough to call a fair catch and catch it. Well, first you have to have the kid that's going to see it. He's got to see it first, yes. I mean, you have to see it coming, pretty much call a fair catch or compete with five other guys that are coming at you unimpeded. It's a tough play. You're going to see a lot of kids make a business decision on that one. Yeah, so, I mean, it makes sense, especially with how many times we kick it down the right sideline. Mm-hmm. So. Well, that's all I got for Glen Oak. Seems to be all you got, too. So, let's get into a little Black Swarm Podcast film room action, huh? Right. You know, last week we were fairly uh, successful on the YouTubes, and by that I mean we managed to get a video on YouTube. <laughs> it so, did get uploaded, yeah. Yes, it that did. That was pretty get, much the whole extent of it. 
So now that we got that little test run out of the way, we, uh, and by we, I mean Rob, he's been working on this while I've been off playing, you know, Army or Coast Guard or Navy or whatever the hell's Jim likes to say I'm in. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Always something you want to hear. <laughs> Always something you want to hear from your producer. Where'd it go? So while he's doing that, I mean, <laughs> we're going to... saw it right there. Right? Yeah, it was there. And now it disappeared. And it's gone now. We're going to try and keep this as... Yeah, one take as possible. One take as possible. Also, Am try I and keep it as mind? like audio only as possible. Bring up the yeah. bar at the bottom. There you go. I know, but it's just it's not popping up anywhere. That's my whole concept. Oh, good. All right. Audacity's gone now, so our... Nah, I've minimized it. We're good. Okay. Wonderful. So, as soon as he gets this up, the plan now is review a little molar film, a little Glen Oak film, too. Maybe get into some Mansfield preview, and then from there roll into our full Mansfield preview. Um, a little answer some fan questions. I got a couple that we missed, well, that we recorded before they came in from last week and from this week, too. And then we can finish it up with a top fiver. Uh, looking to change up that segment a little bit as well. And then we can just keep it rolling. So it looks like we got the game recap. Yeah, I got to put it up on the screen, though. Okay. They're not able to see it yet. Oh, once we have our third person, like Jim, you know, if Jim was here right now, this would be so much easier. Because remember how I told you the mouse was working fine without a mouse pad over here? It's not now, isn't it? Yeah, it's starting to act weird. Remember how I, remember how I told you to get a mouse pad and you said no? <laughs> it will be all right. How big do... I mean, we, we don't need... Nobody's actually watching us, right? No, not one bit. They're definitely not going to see you just do that on the hop. No, that's live recording I do. No, that. I know. They're going to see you do that. Oh, no, I know. No, I'm, sarcasm. Okay. Yeah, sure. Whatever. All right, so this is uh, the Maslin vs. Gwen Oak huddle highlights um, from Maslin's perspective. Okay. So if you want me to pause or go back or something, let me know. I got you. Looks like a 25-yard run here coming. Oh, first play of the game coming yeah. out and uh, look like a little tray formation action, just a tight end and two wide receivers outside him. I think that was inside zone. Looked like just a nice downhill run. Uh, with our... It's from the first drive still. Oh, yeah, counter. That was another thing. Um, the, you know, the touchdown they finally gave us, and then that fourth and five, you know, nut up or shut up time. We come out and just run GT counter action. I'm sorry, GF counter, but also an interesting concept they ran there with the... Rewind that for a second. Come on, you can go uh, back um, a little... No, not forward. I told you, the mouse is struggling over here. A little struggling action. It yeah. looks like they're running a little uh, little quads passing concept. So you get the three verts from the trip side, and then the running back immediately run to the flat right out underneath it. It's a shame the protection didn't hold up because that might have been... Uh, yeah, it had a little bit of a stunt there mm-hmm. with the, the mic in the end. End comes in clean. Misses it initially, but Mike cleans it up. And then shout out to our... Was that our... Rewind at 10? Our Sam linebacker just passing off those verts, running with the wheel, which it looked like they wanted to hit. Yeah. Good Overall, great play by the defense. All right, looks like come out two by two. This is going to be the deep ball down the sideline. Sophomore to sophomore connection, drops it right in a bucket. Um, Looked like just plain old seven-man protection, four verts there. Rewind it again for me if you could. Looks like straight cover one across the board. And he just found his matchup he liked, took a shot, and there we go. Far guy away from the high safety. Mm-hmm. 21, who is that? Uh, Toll, sophomore. Hmm. Trail gets his helmet ripped off right here. Oh, yeah. Seems pretty angry about it. I wouldn't be too happy about that one. The fake bubble and go. You can see the uh, corner bites up on the bubble. The outside guy fakes the block mm-hmm. and makes a hell of a play. Make a man miss. Leaves getting down there, throwing a shoulder. Good. That Rewind that again. 
Just pay attention to the block leaves throws because that's a very good very, open field. Kind of gets in the way, but it's not egregious because mm-hmm. I think that is technically against the rules. He had him teed up. He could have taken his head off there, and a lot of players would do that. Which would have been a, a penalty. So, yes. I mean, good job. To, I mean, a little bit of incidental contact. I mean, even if it's on purpose, so it's not incidental. But, you know, um, they're not really going to call that. The refs didn't. It. it was right in front of them. Mm-hmm. They could see it. Uh, in real time, what I noticed here was, you know, Leibor is actually way more open on this play. Yeah. But I'm assuming that Slaughter's first read probably is tolls on this. So and that's the one you go with. You know, he's open. Give it to him. Another good thing about it is he's so open. He just he throws it to him. Um, he just puts it right on him. Mm-hmm. You don't have to go catch it in stride. Like let him stop, collect himself, catch the ball. And yeah. then go make a move. You know, a lot of times you'll see people miss this because I mean he's so wide open. You don't have to throw it in stride; just throw it up for him. I remember the um, when we were in the same kind of concept with our fake now screen and go against Winton Woods in 2018. I remember talking about that same thing before. You know, when a dude just wide open, yeah. you see that as a quarterback, heart might start beating a little faster. As a receiver, you know, it's like, oh god, like it just starts coming in slow motion. Like you're just so open. That's all you can think about. Like just make this throw and don't drop it. And that's how you can figure out who are your dudes and who's just out there, you know, filling in spaces for you. Yeah. I would I would hazard to guess Slaughter saw this corner bite up hard on the bubble mm-hmm. when he gave the little pump and he's yeah. immediately like throwing it to my guy. I don't need to read anything, just throw it to my guy. Yeah, I think the weird thing about this is that the safety actually goes for the sideline route rather than the seam route. The safety probably saw it coming. I would guess the seam route's not even part of the play. The seam's probably just there to occupy the safety. The safety must <laughs> yeah. have read it tremendously. I, I so, and, then, yeah. and then, I mean, good play to yeah. avoid the safety here. Let's just watch it one more time in all its glory. With the background music that I really hope's not on our recording. Um, Only what the microphone picks up. Beautiful. I muted it on the computer, but... Bam. Just got to get in the way, kid. That's all you did. All you needed to do. All he did. Yep. Six for us. They're going to see the mouse on there, too. No, nah, the mouse is off. Yeah. Cool. Trail being a dude. Uh, can you rewind the... Yeah. No? Nothing? Jim, come do this for us. Oh, my God. <laughs> can you show the run play one more time? I'm trying to see what I'm trying. Ran. All right. The mouse worked perfectly before we started this. And now do you think all... the troubleshooting and then and people just watching us like just stumble through this is better <laughs> or worse? I kind of wish I wouldn't have blinded the mouse so they could see how stuttery it is right now. <laughs> now it just looks like, oh, what's going on? They, don't, yeah. they have no idea. All right, there we go. Uh, a little too much on your computer right now, huh? No, nah, that's not it. Remember how you said your computer was a god and it could handle this all just fine? It can. That's not an issue. It's probably just mad at us for trying to rewind it so many times. <laughs> it's finally registering all those skip back 10 seconds you hit. Yeah. Yep. Off. <laughs> I hit a lot of them. We just, we just come back right to the beginning of film. Essentially. I don't think you're going to get this one. All right. Well, I didn't see a guard pull off rip, so a little zone run action. Um, uh, at least it paused when you hit pause. That's good. Yeah, that's a good sign. This is just wonderful for the audio only audience right now. <laughs> they have no idea what's going on. Yeah, well, you know, watch it on YouTube. It won't be an <laughs> issue. It's the Black Swarm podcast. Black Swarm is all one word. You know, come subscribe, like it, comment, all that good stuff. Give us some interaction. You know, we're trying to get more fan interaction. All right, Rob's got some stuff here. Now we're good. Now we're back in the money. No, I don't have it pulled up yet, though. <laughs> oh, so this is Trell's highlight film. Yeah, so this is Trell's highlight film from Glen Oak. And once I click the button, I'm about to go sit at the desk, to be honest. Or I have a mouse that works. Oh, my God. Just go up, sit at the desk, please. Why is that? All right. I think the best part is, like, the YouTube audience is now watching us in a little box with a mostly black screen. All right. If you could bring that back to the beginning see how, so we can see how Tro reverse field. 
Oh, that's okay. That's starting point. Little mid zone action that felt very outside zone ish from the line, but Trout hitting B gap that hard like he did without really trying to get outside tells me a little mid zone here. First play of the game, inside zone, him hitting the seam and now watch this one. ooh. Oh, a little outside zone. Okay. See a little counter action right there. Outside zone, just us getting the edge on the defense and Trell going and being a dude. Counter F. Trell getting up in there. Look like some more zone runs. Very just... Yeah. Inside zone, you know, dive right on the goal line. Love to see it. And back to the first play again, I guess. Oh, God, I got to keep talking. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, not great. Uh, let's see. Come back. First play. We're just getting that first play from all the different angles. And by all the different angles, I mean the same angle, the same sideline angle, just zoomed in various distances. All right, coming out in our heavy personnel. Oh, I think this is the fourth and five. Yeah. A little GF counter action. That's some, I think that really speaks to what our coaches think about the line is, you know, it's fourth and five. It doesn't matter who your opponent is. That's, that's nut crunch time. And for us to come out and run just heavy personnel counter and for the line to execute like they did, hey, man, I think we're going to go far with this team. All right, now we're going to jump into uh, some molar film. This is their highlights first, so we can look at some you know stuff that happened, maybe walk it, talk it through, and... Just uh, check her out. So let's get it rolling. All right. 21 yard touchdown. Oh, so this is the first or second play of the game. Yep. You can see they have that outside zone action down into the boundary with just a quick little bubble RPO. Looks like the read man is the Sam linebacker up top there, number, what's that, 14? Yep. And as soon as he triggers on that run, which, you know, he's supposed to do, that's the point of the RPOs here, quarterback knows immediately throw that bubble. In fact... I don't think he read it at all. But. He did, that, that looked like more of a pre-snap read, just kind of based on his alignment. He's like, yep, throwing this bubble now. And then he throws it there. You can see the safety kind of just take a bad angle on it. Receiver turns that corner and makes a hell of a play. All right. We don't need to watch him celebrating like this on our field. Uh, if you don't like it, stop him. Fair enough. A little tunnel screen there to the number two oh, in the was trips. It though? Was it, though? All right, bring her back for me. Where's the line of scrimmage? Line of scrimmage looks to be about the 42. 42? Yeah. Let's see where he catches it. Just curious. Oh, he comes back. He, okay. he catches That's on That's behind. 40. That's fine. Yeah. That one's fine. Yeah, that was good. That was actually a screen. Mm -hmm. Corner comes up, makes a tackle. I think that was a corner. Yeah, the corner missed the tackle. Yeah. Safety comes up, makes a tackle. Let's see here. We'll swing route. Yep. Bad camera angle. Can't really see anything except for no. 10 violently just attacking people outside <laughs> of the play. All right. So they started off with the... Uh, the blocking back lined up outside in the true trips formation. Motion him in. Bring him up. And a little counter action. Looks like the... What is that, our OB or outside backer? He just gets sucked in yeah. to the play. They wrap around it. Get up to the... Look like the edge, edge defender just took himself outside the play. Good play by the safety to chase it down. Yeah. Hell of a play by 30 there. Okay, what do we got? What do we got? What do we got? Oh, here's another, your... Another little screen. That This is the one we talked about. 
Yeah, because this is the one that I noticed in real time. Mm-hmm. Um, the inside receiver... Yeah, so the slot receiver goes up and blocks. So we're going to call the ball on the know, 21 to be conservative. No, that's 16. Or 16. Yeah. So that's yeah. on the 16. So you see the left outside receiver on like a drag route. Oh, I forgot my mouse isn't working. Yeah, um, yeah so the outside receiver is going to come underneath that inside re- receiver on the left side. Just, uh, it's just going to go straight up and block. So as long as the pass is behind the line of scrimmage, it's fine. If it's downfield, that would be pass interference um and then there's also the possibility of wiggle man downfield depending on the linemen where they are in the situation yeah i guess we'll see here let's see here. catches like it like on the 16 just behind 15 it. and a half i mean i think that's okay i guess yeah some they're just i guess in real time it looked it, forward but they're just really good at coming down the line i guess it, so Mm-hmm. On the line of scrimmage, you know, you can argue it's behind if it's that close, I guess. But, but you see that the inside receiver just went up and blocked right away. You mm-hmm. have linemen that are upfield currently. Yeah. So um, and then, as long as it's behind the line, it's fine. And good play design on their part. That play's only going to him because they swing the half back out to good the right. Good play by the ref. Look at this. <laughs> that guy. Ooh, Getting I'm the hell the out of the way. All right. The two receivers on the right just run vertical clear outs and looking to block somebody downfield. Okay, here we go. Six, six yard pass, just a little bang eight route, one yep. on one in the middle. Look like that same RPO that they scored on earlier, except he's the slots running a little quick little bang eight rather than a bubble. So you see the whole defense gets sucked in on that run action, and the number two receiver just makes a Makes a man miss, and he's gone for six. Yeah, I think the interesting thing here is how we're lined up on defense um, because I believe that's your safety on the outside, Mm -hmm. corner in the middle. So you're looking at a man situation there, right? Go go back and if you can, like, just get that to where we're lined up at. This is as good as you're going to see it from right here. So this is going to be your corner. No, that's that's your safety. Is it? Yeah, that's your safety because the corner's outside. You can see when he Except comes in. Except for 24 is a safety and one is a corner. You, which said, is... you said we had a lot of rotation going on. <laughs> okay, yes. But your corner was still a corner and your safety is still a safety. I think they're matching safety up against this bigger, possibly tight end. And the yeah. corner was lined up in the seam against the receiver um, in that situation. I'm, right, I'm cool. guessing. Yeah, could be. I mean, it definitely looks like that to me. I mean, it looks like our sh- our coverage shell. Pause it right now. It looks like your standard too high. Yeah. But I think our corner and safety are inverted down here. Hmm. It, that could very well just be a matchup thing. Uh, either way, I guess with everybody triggering that hard on the run action, it might be a cover zero blitz. I... Uh, yeah, with as hard as our OB was coming in, like didn't even really stop, just try to get in the way of the pass. And just a heck of a play by Muller. Yeah, you got one on one in the middle, you know, mm-hmm. make the tackle. He missed. Okay, here's the running back scene. This play found a clip of it on YouTube from a wider angle, so you could really see what was going on. But rewind it back and just pause at the beginning. And I ended up watching this play a few times. Okay, so that's immediate post-snap. So I think what we're doing here is we're playing a cover four check to trips. It's got a bunch of different names. I learned it as poach. Um, you got poach, steal, solo. Really what it functionally means is because in base cover four, your safety is keying off of the number two receiver to his side. If he goes vertical, then he covers that receiver. If he does anything besides go vertical, then he turns back to look to help on number one. And your Mike linebacker is responsible for the three man. If he goes vertical, then he's got to cover him vertical. Mm -hmm. That's all well and good against two by two formations, except when you get into trips, suddenly that number three is a receiver lined up out wide where... If everybody goes vertical, so if that number two goes vertical, the safety over the trips has him. Your number three 
to the backside is going to be a running back. Almost never goes vertical out of those sets. Yeah. So that backside safety is going to look to help on number one, and suddenly you have your Mike linebacker trying to cover a receiver streaking down the field. So you have a trips check like poach, where if that number three safe if that number three receiver goes vertical, your backside safety is going to go over top and cover him to give your <clears throat> Mike linebacker some help. Only trouble there is backside basically turns into man. Mm-hmm. The second part of the play is it looks like our OB back, the where he's lined up pretty much down on the line as the backside end, is playing a, a rush peel technique. So he starts the play rushing the passer, and if you're running back free releases, then he goes to cover him. And most of the time, that running back is going to be run as a swing or a flat. Easy enough to block from that position. Unfortunately here... He immediately turns up the seam, goes vertical. You're not going to be able to cover that from the assignment that that OB is tasked with. Not easily. Uh, The way the other two receivers run their routes up top pretty lazily, and the fact that on the bottom you're not going to be able to see it on the screen, but you can kind of see it on the wide angle from whatever new shot that that YouTube clip was from. He just runs deep, runs a stop, holds that corner, that number three running straight vertical down the field clears out that backside safety. You've got a one-on-one with your OB back trying to cover that running back from a very disadvantageous position. This, to me, looks like they probably had an idea of what we like to do. It's a very basic trips check, and it's basic because it works. It's very functional. That's why a lot of teams run it. So they saw that's what we were running earlier in the game because this didn't happen until well after halftime. Mm-hmm. And this was just a specific, this coverage beater that they had dialed up, ready to go. So go ahead and show it again, and you can watch it all play out. So if you rewind it one more time, you can watch the safety up top, get eyes on that three, watch the jack, um, take a couple steps upfield to rush, as soon as that back peels, he tries to go cover him, and not happening. Yeah. Pretty good play by Bowler. You know, sometimes... You know, right there, you can see um, in our OB backer, who's going from that <clears throat> technique, trying to chase here, and up top, that safety that you would initially assume is the one making this play just all focused on the opposite side of the field. So, I mean, an absolute perfect play call against the scheme that we had on defense. Sometimes you get yours, sometimes you get got. This time, we got got. Got got. You know, good throw, just put it on him. Corners all the way down, covering his man, essentially. Yeah, good play. And then that exact same play they come out, they came out with against us in the first play of the game to get their first touchdown. You get that stretch run action down into the boundary, throwing the bubble out to the slot. Yep. Safety takes another bad angle. Except now you can watch it play out in real time. Or slow time, maybe. Or slow time. That's weird. Looks like Windows... Media player just does not like all this extra activity going on. Maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, just had a dungeon a little bit, I guess. Yeah. But bad angle, same thing that happened, uh, like first play of the game, second play of the game, hmm. except for longer that time. So some stats. I don't know exactly how accurate those are. I think that's Huddle um, created that itself. Yeah. Because I saw it on the Mass one as well. Um, do you want to see the mass on highlights? Yes, I do. Because we, you know, we got got, but we still got some of ours. Alrighty. All right, trips formation. Just basic RPO. Uh, run that back for me one more time. Look like we're just running a basic. You know, zone run action to the single side. You get your trips running the quick smoke screen. Your number two is 
going out to block most dangerous man. Number three is going out to block second most dangerous man. 19 makes a man miss, picks up some yards, makes good play. Exactly what that's supposed to do. All right, motion the fullback. So you got... Look like just a little one-back power action, essentially, to the nub side. Tight ends response, motion the fullback away from the play, try and get bodies away from it. Fullbacks, or I'm sorry, tight end is essentially responsible for digging that end out rather than the fullback kicking him out. You got your guard wrapping. Trail follows his blocks, makes a man miss, gets outside to daylight, makes a play. Yeah, so you got that end who cuts inside of the tight end. Corner crashes inside as well. Mm -hmm. Trail goes outside where they aren't. Which, as an end, you want to box that rather than spill it. I think he did a good job trying to stay outside of it. Corner made a bad run fit, mm -hmm. as corners do. And there's that beautiful pitch and catch to uh, Banks there. Look like, run that back for me again. There's max protection fades. It looked like heavy personnel trying to suck the rest of the defense up. Pick your matchup. Who do you like? Throw it up to him. Let him be a dude. Yep. Great throw, great catch. All right. 18-yard pass here. A little two-by-two two action. Ooh, our drive concept. A little scramble. Scramble drill. So drive, that's something. It, it's kind of disappeared from the playbook the last couple years. Uh, good to see it coming back because I know Trox likes to spam the hell out of this one because it's a good concept. The The heart of it basically is you just have your number two receiver, which would be at the bottom here, running a dig. Your number two receiver from the other side running a shallow route, trying to high-low the middle linebacker. Look like they were trying to stay in man coverage there. Uh, keep the back in protection, which we had to do a lot because of just how – attacking their defense was from so many different ways and get it out to is that lennox 19 19 who's 19 you got the roster right there yeah here you go but good job by slaughter moving around in the pocket getting out to the open guy 19 wiggins wiggins he has he was a name i had no idea of early in the season and he's come on, made some big plays the last couple weeks for us. So here it looks like, go back to that just right at the beginning of it for me. Stop. Oops. Uh-oh, a little too far. We'll ride it out. So here's something you can see where they really like to, how much they like to move. Come out, everybody down on the line, say for one guy, you got press man up top. You got three over three at the bottom over the trips. It looks like cover zero uh, play. And pause. So it looked like some kind of roll to cover one. You can see that guy up top there dropping down, trying to get to the just a little deeper over top, be able to cap anything that maybe comes his way. But we just have a nice little rewind it for him one more time. Either inside zone or just a guard wrap. Yeah, looks like you got the guard wrapping around. All you're trying to do is just the line the rest of the line essentially is blocking man on man. Backside guard pulls. Running back follows him to daylight. Slaughter getting outside of pressure. Sees open field, takes it. What do we run there? Never Pass mad wise. about that. No. Okay, so here's our drive concept from three by one. All you're really doing is moving your drag route from the number two to the back side to the number three to the front side, which it sounds simple enough, but honestly it pulls the strings on the coverage in such a different way that I would almost classify that as like a different kind of passing concept. Uh, looks like they have it covered up pretty good. You got, you know, banks at the bottom. Looks like the corners over top of them pretty well. You're number one up top to the trip side. If he's even, I'm leaving. You know, that could be a shot that 
uh, Slaughter would maybe look to take, but drive routes or the uh, the drag route down at the bottom is pretty well covered up. You got a man yeah. looking to crash on him. The dig route up top, you got a guy playing over top of him, and then another guy backside looking ready to crash down on him. He tries to throw that ball. Slaughter doesn't like the look. Mm. Takes off, and like we saw. Nice yeah, and more than up. anything, I think the timing of it here. I mean, like you said, you know, a little drag's covered initially. Um, you, know, you got that dig, like maybe there's a small window there. It looks like safety's jumping it pretty good. We'll see it as we roll it. But you already have that end running the hoop right on you there. Yeah. So, I mean, it's going to be a split second as soon as we hit play, if it works, that um, he's going to have to make a decision. Boom, got to get out of there. Yeah, that dig's completely covered up. Had no chance to even go through the progression to get to that up top one on one. Open daylight takes off and run. Yep, and that would be one of those things. Like usually the outside routes on drive, it's kind of a matchup thing. If you get a certain look, um, you have a game plan for it, or if it's just something you see in the flow of the game, you can you know tell the quarterback on the sideline, "Hey, we're going to call this play again. Peek out here. If you see this, throw it up." Mm-hmm. And with those outside routes, you can. You know, run curls, um, posts, stops, comebacks, really anything you want that's going to win that receiver that matchup in the best way. Yep. Uh, I got some Leno Kylites. All right. Let's check her out. Let's dive right into it. Well, let me get it pulled up on the screen, I guess. Again, get the opener. We watched this one to death on Trails Highlights. Still, though, good to see the line up front getting some push and open up a big hole to let Trail make a play. Did we watch this entire video already? Yes. Yes, we did. So, let's... Uh, I got a different one. Hold on. All right. All right. We're all going through a little growing pains here. We took that short break and I already forgot what we're... Uh, Cody Ferris highlights linebacker just already in the backfield making a play you know just nowhere to go um, heavy set looks like they're trying to run a little counter action get the guard pulling looking to kick out the end fullback looking to wrap through looks like Cody shoots through a backside gap and is just in the backfield before anybody can do anything yeah we were running a lot of stunts with both inside backers crossing mm-hmm um, not sure how many are on the, this highlight, but I think that's one of them there. I would call it a blitz, even though it ends up if you're kind oh. of. So here's kind of one. They're not. They didn't cross here. I just, think it was just a right now. Just double A gap blitz. The, the yeah, the gap's so open that. Oh, that's the one. So this was l- a lot later in the game. Yeah, they lined up in. I think it was a two by two or maybe three by one. Doesn't matter. Motion the. You could watch it happen. Motion to true empty. Three to one side, split out wide, two to the other. And you could watch us go to our empty check, which for this game, for most games really, I think, is just blitz. Send the house. Uh, You're sending more rushers than they have blockers, especially when they're both going up the A-gap like that. Look at this. So what play do you think this is? That is... Off- offensively. Offensively? They, I mean, it's not a screen or anything, is it? No, they motion. Okay. So, so I didn't, didn't watch get this. to see it develop, but they motioned yeah. it. Empty. So, well, watch this center. He dives down like his career depends on it in a pass set. Okay, let's check her out. Falls on his face and just leaves both a caps <laughs> open. <laughs> so I would say that is I, just... Like, what are, I'm just like, my thought process on it is, why are you that? So with, Why are you diving that hard on a pass, first off? So a lot of, um, and this is more higher level football stuff, you can still kind of run it at the lower levels. With quick game, the ball's going to come out so quick that the... Uh, I mean, I mean that was my first that, thought process. If it's really quick, you can you can go for it. But so with quick game, 
the ball's going to come out so quick, the pass rush isn't going to get there. And as a defensive lineman, if you can't get to the quarterback, then throw your hands up, yeah, get your hands in the way of the pass. Yeah. So a way to combat that in your pass protection is really just cut block or dive at the legs, do whatever you can, because yeah. as a defensive lineman, you're going to want to try and... Well, the issue here is that the guard's also on. Unless he was thinking that Pringle was coming B, guard would have to slide over. I got to dive backside real quick. But, I mean, really, it, this could have been a chop block. Yeah. Penalty. Also, is that Big Mike? No, that's, who's that, 73? Yeah. 73 is da, 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 da. Isaiah McElroy, 5'10", 290 junior. I mean, that center could have just been getting his ass kicked all night and said, this is my best course of action I can take. Uh, here's what we're going to roll with. Yeah, I guess. Or it could just be a kid being a kid. and I feel like by this point you've seen so many A-gap blitzes. That, but, all right. Uh, they both come free, and he was there first. Bam. Yeah. Good tackle. But if that is his uh, responsibilities at A-gap, then nose tackles his man. Can't let him cross your face. Can't let him get through A-gap. And backers just need to get worked out in the wash. Gotcha. Okay, so here they tried to go for a little two-back, um, full-back look, you know, kind of like a shotgun wishbone type deal. And we just didn't let them do anything that second half. So you can let it roll. Scrapes over, makes a play. Look like a little power action following his pulling guard to daylight, working. Scrapes over, makes a play. 34 getting in there untouched shout out to the lineman there roll that back again because i think i saw the play side guard pulling for i mean we could just do both of them real quick but yeah Yeah, like they're trying to run a little buck sweep or pin pull action comes in untouched makes a play so this is later in the game very late i think Yeah, and that was our fourth down stop, which something I wanted to talk about. Um, or no, this is the one with the flag. All right, so right here, you'll see flag comes in. Mm-hmm. It's third and one, third and one and a half. Yeah. We stop them short. We decline the penalty to make it fourth and one rather than third and six, which I thought was surprising at the time. Mm-hmm. But it paid out because we stopped them on fourth down. But at this time, I believe it was mostly second unit, except for Pringle and Fair was, were still in there as our inside backers. And uh, w- the very next play was pretty much exactly like this one, the, the outcome at least. Um, Pringle and Fair hmm. get there. They stop them short. But Third and short, declining a penalty, man, that's into fourth and short territory yeah that's, like, that's why i was i was really surprised by it because i was like well why don't you want to make it third especially with your second unit out there like yeah. do you really want to make it fourth and a, a yard rather than third and six but our front seven were hey. doing so good that it worked you know fourth fourth and one stop out there so uh i'm just as a head coach like what do you who are you talking to with that are you telling the other team that you're not going to be able to make a play on us? Or are you telling your front seven, hey, it's fourth and one now. Nut up time. Yeah. Let's go. A little bit of both maybe. But, I mean, I liked it. I mean, of course it worked. But at the same time, like, it wasn't going to hurt the game at all. So you tell your defense, you know, hey, fourth and one. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I like the call too. Um, And at that point in the game, in the flow of the game, we had them so overwhelmed they couldn't do anything offensively. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, hell of a play. Yeah, absolutely. That was, uh, if not all of it, that was pretty much all of the previous footage that I have. All right. Let's, um, we could preview Mansfield a little bit, roll through the roster, see, you, uh, you know, if they got any playmakers or not, show a little film on them, what they're going to look like. I didn't make it to Booster Club. I haven't followed Mansfield at all. Yeah. You can get ready to show that. I have their last two games pulled up. We can just rattle through those real quick. Okay. All right. So let's see here. I didn't have to save my favorites. That's on me. Hand up. That's on me. This guy. Okay. So Mansfield 2-0 and currently. Yes. Week one, they beat a 
currently 0-2 Norwalk, 41-19. Yeah, they're not great. And then beat a currently one on or a one and one Hoover, forty two to nine. Yeah. So I mean, I think that one started off a little bit closer. Don't mm-hmm. have the box score. Um, but I believe it was a lot closer in that first half, and then they pulled away in the second. But uh, that entire game is on YouTube. So if you want to watch Mansfield versus Hoover in the entirety, it's on there. Um, I have some highlights of different things. Uh, I didn't pull the entire game. I didn't go through it to try to pick plays out of the entire game. But um, I was going to say if this was a short podcast, we could like, just pull it up and run through it. But yeah. this is not going to be a short podcast. So, nope, does not seem to be. Um, we'll probably just leave it up to the fans. that, If you're that interested, the entire Hoover-Mansfield game is on YouTube. Just YouTube-Mansfield-Hoover. Like, yeah. it, it'll pop up. So. So I got a real before you get into the thing. I got a real quick just screenshot of what it looks like they like to run offensively and defensively. Mm-hmm. And I read through the Booster Club um, okay. article. So on the paper, it he showed their offense likes to line up, and um, their base thing is just a two by two pistol set. So you know, two wide receivers split out wide each side. Running back line up in the pistol, which is just you know, six to eight yards deep directly behind the Yeah. They do run a lot of pistol. And the the article said Coach Moore mentioned that they are pretty multiple offense, so they look yes. a lot like us. Mm-hmm. They'll, you know, spread it out, get in heavier sets too when they need to. Defensively, it looks pretty base personnel. They said it's similar to us, three four. Uh looks like they keep their According to the picture, they like to keep their jackbacker, the backside outside linebacker, down the line a little more. Looking like a little press man cover one action on there. So the article did say we're expecting some man coverage in that. Uh, I mean, yeah, so they'll change things up. They have good corners. They have good safeties. So they will press. So that's, you know... Anytime that's an option, that's something you got to prepare for because you just don't see it all that often, I guess. Um, or at least teams that run it a decent a bit. So uh, they will press, but I mean, I I'll see them in one high. You see them in two high. When I was watching, I was watching their one player's highlights from last year. He's supposed to be their star player. When I was reading articles online, what position? Uh, he's a receiver and a safety. Ah. Uh, Amar Davis. Uh, their coach calls him Amar the Star. <laughs> uh, going, I think that was going into this into his junior year. So okay. like the preview for week one when they're talking to their coach down there. Love a good name that sets up for a nickname. Yeah, I mean Amar the Star, and uh, he's a guy they expect to be a you know multiple D one offer type of player. Really fast, really instinctive. I was watching his plays, but when I was watching it, his highlights from last year, it looked like he was almost exclusively a, a one high free safety. Okay. So whereas, there. whereas the more I dove into things, like yeah, you do see them in too high, mm-hmm. um, so it's not just straight. They mix it up, uh, but you will see them press. You'll see them press and bail. You'll see them just play off. So they mix it up, but they definitely will press. Okay. Any other star players to note on there? We don't need to rattle through the entire roster, but just yeah. anybody that uh, stands out. Yeah. So I think they got a couple players that go both ways. Uh, Amar Davis, like we talked about, he's a junior, six foot one seventy five. Uh, he's very fast, really athletic, uh, very instinctive. Just looks like a real good football player. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of his highlights were on defense from his sophomore year, uh, and he just he reads the quarterback really well. Um, I don't want to say too much. I was watching his highlights, and yeah. you know, you only see his highlights. With that, I think there could have been a few times last year where he could have got lost in the sauce by reading too much. But he's so fast that it makes up for it. He mm-hmm. gets a drop and then just reads everything in front of him. Um, I imagine he's better this year. I know he has a couple interceptions this year already. Uh, just insanely instinctive. He'll break up on a pass. I mean, like a lightning bolt. You know, he'll read somebody cutting across the middle and dive on it. Very instinctive player. Uh, and then on offense, he's a good route runner, fast athlete. I mean, he's the guy you're going to have to watch both ways for sure. Uh, he's their number one target on offense. What I found interesting on that is we 
have him listed as a Z receiver. And I'm yep. guessing we base that off of like how we so he plays would call he plays inside yeah. mostly. The thing is, their two best receivers, I think, line up in the slot more than anything okay. when they go four wide. Which I don't know if they really go four wide quite as much as you made it seem. They are multiple. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they base out of it. Their other two receivers, they're not non-factors, but they have a top two guys for sure. Gotcha. The other two are kind of there. Um, they have some speed or size, and mm-hmm. you might take a shot with them, but that's about it. They're not a huge factor in the offense. That doesn't mean that you can't throw one up to him down the sideline. He has two catches for 140 yards. Yeah. You know, but when it actually comes to their play calling, what they do, uh, they're not. They're definitely not the top two targets. I mean, it's one and two, a very long gap, and then three and four. So gotcha. the top two guys, Amar Davis, like we talked about, and then uh, the other one. Uh, da, 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 so while you're finding that Nate Dismook, I mean he's a sophomore, but he's their number two. Plays okay. outside and slot. They move him around, so it's not just slot. Uh, they have him listed as an H, but gotcha. Um, so the their top two targets basically the as much as they can like to keep them off the line, be able to move them around and try and get them the their guys you want with the ball in yeah, their hands. I, uh, the Amar Davis kid will also play in the backfield. Oh, every now and then. All right, but it's usually kind of predictable. Mm. behavior for putting a receiver in the back is it like two back stuff or is it like he's the only guy oh, in the I'm, I'm not sure how i'm not sure when they line him up back there uh they will line him out line him up in the backfield um or they have gotcha. but it's usually not your stereotypical they're not using him as a running back right you know swing passes or running him out of the backfield kind of get matchups mm. they're not really using him as a running back okay so but he will line up back there they move him around um Keontes bradley he has an offer to Kentucky as a corner, but he'll play receiver. He's 6'3", 195. He's got the size. He's got the speed, but he's not a natural receiver, it seems. Um, but he is an SEC-offered corner. Uh, their other receiver, Owens, he's 6'5", 225. And he's a guy that, you know, they'll take a deep shot to him. He's 6'5". Yeah, that's... but he's not a huge part of the offense. Okay, but a threat nonetheless. So um, they have a really big offensive line, not insanely great. They have some players that are better than others. In general, they're a big line. Got um, it. Big, not great. The right side of the line is better than the left side of the line. Um, Look to run, but they like to pull. So that doesn't mean they're not going to run left because they can pull the right guard. Mm-hmm. Or maybe they pull guard and tackle. I'm not, not entirely sure. But the right side, as they line up, is better than the left side. But they go 6'4", 280, 6'2", 250, 6'2", 330, 6'3", 315, 6'4", 290. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, 280, 250, 330, 315, 290. The center is the one that's 330s, a sophomore. He's he's out there. He's still young. <laughs> he's, he's snapping the ball. Yeah. Yeah. 330-pound uh, center. Yeah, not he's out there. Not doing a lot of moving. Yeah, so uh, the right guard, right tackle, sp- specifically the right tackle, um, the best part of their line. Okay. Uh, quarterback, what's he like? Yeah, so quarterback, um, there's a lot of talk about him down there. The the, the media loves him. Down there, I thought um, they were over there. Yeah, I guess it is over there, just due west. But the only time you go to Mansfield is if you're going to Columbus. Which is just the worst thing in the world. Don't you, like, <laughs> couldn't Maslin, like, be some, or there just needs to be a better route from yeah. Maslin to Columbus. I hate the fact that people that live in Medina, Cuyahoga Falls, Strongsville, they can get to Columbus in the exact amount of time it takes us to get to Columbus, and they're an hour north of us. But nonetheless, Mansfield is on the way to down there. On you the have, way to down. Yeah, you have to go dead west yeah. to go dead south. So, um, all right, so dead west of us, the media people love this quarterback, or they're very intrigued by him, I should say, uh, Duke Reese, Ress, 6'4", 205 junior, shows flashes. Um, that's how they describe him. Uh, I'm going to call him Ressy. That's fine, Duke Ressy. Let's go with it. And he will throw some amazing passes. And then he'll throw some where it's like, what is this guy doing? So, I don't want to say inconsistent, mm-hmm. but you don't know what you're going to get every play. 
he throws a very good seam ball, specifically um, number uh, number three is running up the seam. That's they like to do that. I'm not sure if it's just a four verts concept or it could just be, but number three up the seam, they love that. Throws a beautiful pass up the middle. He'll put it right over a linebacker's head, inside a safety, under a safety. That's his best throw. Um, something he's been consistent with. But I was, I remember seeing a picture because like he's, like I said, the media love him. So there's a picture of him throwing, and it's like almost the picture of it is like almost sidearm. Hmm. So I don't know. Well, Philip Rivers actually. Maybe there. he was just throwing that one sidearm. Maybe that is his natural throwing motion. I mean, I got some film. We can watch it. Yeah, but I haven't looked at it since then to see if he does throw. Um, but if his arm slot is changing a little bit each throw, if it's not a super consistent arm slot, that could drastically change how, yeah, how much, how good a throw is. So maybe that could be part of it. Hey. Maybe I'm talking completely out of my ass because he never throws sidearm at all. I don't know, but that's just one thing I noticed. My he, money's he on the ladder. Is, yeah, I mean, he has been known to be slightly inconsistent, okay. so that that is a known factor. Maybe he puts it all together and he doesn't miss a throw all huh? all game this week. I don't know. But. All right. Well, rather than uh, us one bags talking about the defense, we can just watch the film. You know, see what happens, see what they look like. Oh, let's see which one I got over here. All right. Come on, big money, big money, big money. Um, let's see. So I got the. So I got. Hoover's quarterback against Mansfield, so that's going to show their defense. I have Hoover's. Yeah, let's check out a little defense, see how they look. Okay, so then, all right, we'll roll with that. Also, God bless Huddle. <laughs> yeah, really though. Like being able to just go in, like, okay, who's this team we're playing this week? What's their defense look like? Who's a quarterback that they played a week or two ago? Let's check out his highlight film. Yeah, I mean that's what's nice is because I was going on there and not every film was up loaded yet you know mm-hmm. as i'm looking on saturday sunday monday not everybody has film up so like mansfield they don't have anything posted yeah. this year or at least they didn't as of yesterday so either they're trying to keep it all concealed as much as possible or they're just slow with putting film up maybe they don't care about it that much you know not, every, not everybody cares about putting up highlights yeah so i mean that's possible um but hoover did have film up of the game so not the full games, though. Hoover do- Hoover players put up stuff, but not as a team. All right. So this film we're watching now, this is the in orange, yes. and then Hoover is in white. Correct. And this is Hoover's quarterback's highlights, so that's what you're going to see here. God, this this uniform matchup looks like a spring game in college. Oh, uh, yeah. You just it got, does, yeah. You know, same helmets. You just got your away jersey and your home jersey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, you'll get a look at... Mansfield's defense here. All right, looks like we got a little too high shell. Uh, scramble drill. Corner stayed pretty sticky. And made a throw, I'm guessing. Whoever's quarterback looks decent. Hmm. I've, I've already watched these, of course, but... Of course. Um, He looks like a decent player. Does a decent right. ball. Rewind that one back for me. And they got beat pretty badly but yeah all right let's see what we got just a little uh oh god my eyes are like i'm trying to watch what they're doing and then you play it and then i just <laughs> like it looks like it's a little read pull um except for i don't necessarily see a read man they're just blocking the end man down yeah i mean that's something a lot of teams and do is just pulls like, it into space cuts inside and makes a play yeah. It's down to the three something. Nice little Ooh. combo underneath the zone. Turns into a bit of a drive concept there. So you get that dig with the um, shallow action. You got the running back out to the trip side to pull that flat defender. Nobody's out there to cover the drive because you want to stay over top of that dig. and. Yep. Great play call. Yeah, I mean, like you said, is that that's the running back that's coming out? Yeah. Yeah, so sucking up that defender there, uh, linebacker, I'm assuming. And then you got the, kind of this two-on-one, a high-low right at the corner. Mm-hmm. And bam, just hits it right underneath. Corner's going to stay high. You got the, that number three just kind of running a bender over the middle to suck up any other defenders. 
Yeah, a lot of leaving guys out on islands. They have the secondary to do it. Oh. Free safety coming up, making a nice big thumping play there. Pulls the ball again, takes off. A little triple option action. Um, run, we're going back to that edge. one. All right, so, and pause it right now. So you got really a unbalanced quince look. You got all five skill guys to one side. Yep. The number two receiver's up on the line, so he's ineligible. He's out there blocking. Looks like they got the number three running a bubble. Uh, quarterback's reading probably that apex defender because it looks like that fullback's going to crash down on the end yeah and it turns into your classic triple option except it's out of a spread look rather than the the old veer so he sees that that's dead long mesh means he's reading somebody there i'd be i'm interested to see both of these plays where he pulled it Mm -hmm. what would happen if that first defender actually got blocked I mean, is he still reading that apex up top? Because if so, he's probably not pulling it, right? Looks like the well, the apex read is more for your bubble after if you got do it. than after you pull it. I got you. Because you got the two blockers up top for the uh, yeah, looks like the corner and safety. Looks like almost where it should go right now. Yeah. Because yeah. especially once he pulls it, now, well, I guess he gets outside of that defender and just yeah. He said, "I'm gonna I'm gonna take it myself." works out first down yeah just kind of a not a whole lot of hoover highlights no from that game um we can i got one more though all right let's see what we got so just nice little look at what um i think this player goes both ways so i'm not sure this might be a little bit of both once again mansfield's on defense also that same kind of look there you got the unbalanced up top with the fullback and the running back down low just looks like you're, the quarterback's not a threat to pull it, but he's reading that apex defender. Just a little ISO action, and if the apex bites up, you can throw it out there on the bubble. Looks right. like that unbalanced stuff so, is like a r- real go-to for them. Yeah. We should be diving into Mansfield more than we are Hoover. Uh, too high, looks like press against three by one. So a little press quarters action. You got the... Corner up top pressed on him. Essentially playing man. I mm-hmm. guess you'd have to watch see if he bails or not. You, the safety over top of number two. But the number two is ineligible. So he's looking to make a play on that. As Yeah, but defenses don't notice To blow that. up the block. Not always. But very rarely do I think defenses notice when there's an unbalanced. Actually, no. I'm sorry. That's ineligible. not unbalanced. He's just so far up on the line. That that should be an eligible yeah. formation because you get the X receiver down yeah, at the he's, bottom. He's a, he's about a full yard off. That's fine. Eh. If, you, if you tell the ref you're off, you're off. You can do that in the NFL because you can't run ineligible formations like that in the NFL. But I'm telling you, if he told the ref he was off the line, he's good. I'm gonna pocket that and take that to the bank because with as much as I love unbalanced formations like that, if, I'm gonna you're gonna try to fake one now. I, I'm gonna run the shit out of that. Yes. If you're off, he's off a, a full yard almost. Listen, I saw it incorrectly, so now I'm just digging in. Okay, let me have this. I know, but I'm just letting you know that as long as he tells... Because yeah. every single time the receivers go out there and report to the official. Mm-hmm. At least they should. should. I mean, when you get into the higher level, you, you aren't. But, I mean, you still see it in high school. You go out there, you report to the official. And if he says, I'm off, the ref's going to give you benefit of the doubt. Or he's going to say, hey, like take a step back. Yeah, they don't throw the flag like without a war. They'll tell you like, "Hey, you're too close to the line. Take a step back." So you go out there, you say, "Hey, I'm off," and they're like, "Yeah, cool, no problem." All right, fair enough. So that did stop it real quick. Oh, little rotation action going. Okay, yeah, they, so I think they start to bail. Here. They initially lined up, you know, kind of how you would see a base quarters look with the safety keying off the number two, lining up over top of him about. 10, 12 yards off. Your Sam linebackers outside apexing the number two receiver and the end man on line scrimmage, which in this case is a tackle. You got your corner down low, just pressed up on him. Since this is trips, they probably got some kind of something going that he's essentially going to be playing man up. And then you got your backside safety just over top of the tackle or sitting on the hash ready to come up and make a play in the backside alley or any kind of vertical threat from the number one. Yeah, I think they end up, and we'll see it, but I think they end up bailing out of this. 
going in a little bit more of a traditional look. Yeah, so there, this corner's already out. Other corner bailed. They rolled over. Rotate. Definitely not a yeah. A more traditional you, four or two yeah, out of that. You can see the uh, the Sam linebacker there going bailing for the flat. Doesn't see the number three or I'm sorry. Mike Mike goes with the running back here. Yeah, Mike Mike takes the final. I think he could run against that look. Okay, so two goes vertical, so safety lets him go. Sam sees the threat from the three coming out, goes down to crash on him. Let me roll it back. I want to see what this first safety does. Does he go with the three? Yeah. Yeah, jumps the three, so now that that's that high low against the corner that we talked about. Yep. That's uh, looks probably like a-, a good situation to where you want to roll your backside safety over, like, what we did yeah so that's another trips adjustment there where you can almost use your mic and your front side safety to high low the three and then you just have your corner and sam kind of high lowing the one and two because how little teams actually throw to the number one out wide and trips like that because normally the quarterback in high school doesn't have the arm to do it it's far throw so here they are all lined up up close with like that little un- one high i mean is, so, this, is this true cover one? So with that unbalanced set, um, this if it's later in the game, this might have been an adjustment for him. Really what you want to do is you walk up a defender on that number two. You just treat him purely like a blocker to blow up any sort of screen. Because from mm-hmm. this look, you can run the now screen, which you know Mass has seen us run for years. Mass and fans have seen us run for years. Where you're trying to get that number two out and block a most dangerous man. Or you can run the bubble with the three, Either way, you want to get your defender up down onto the line in a position to blow up that block and blow up either screen that they're trying to run. Yeah, so kind of disguised as a true cover one, or I think it could be a three even with that corner up top like that. Yeah. Corner, Looks like a cover. Corner down low is bailing, high safety. Yeah. Probably a three. Looks like cover three based on the field corner, just how yeah. he was dropping with eyes on the quarterback. Yeah. And that's a way with a lot of stuff too when you're watching film. You just look for the eyes of the defenders. Where are they at? Are they straight up on their man, or are they mm-hmm. trying to keep an eye on the quarterback? So this is looking like another cover, cover three, three type situation. Cloud in the boundary with yep. no no threat. So that's just an adjustment you would make to like a nub set like that, um, where you just have a tight end outside, or even if it's not a tight end, he's just back there as your oh shit guy in case they get outside of the actual edge defender. Yeah. Looks like they try to run get a little pushed around quite counter a bit action. There. High safety makes a tackle. Yeah. High safety making a tackle on a counter from There was a lot of movement on shotgun that. Shotgun eye formation. Yeah. Tells me they're liable to get run on a little bit. They got they got run. Their defense line isn't big. So that's like worth noting. Mm-hmm. And they run um that three four ish look like we do. Yeah. So not only do they run the three four ish look, but their jackbacker mm-hmm. is not necessarily good against the run. Okay. So something look to take advantage of. They're not Friday. huge and their jackbacker isn't great against the run. So I, I think that just in general should be a recipe for you to run against them. But you know, we'll see. Uh here's Mansfield on offense for the first time that we've seen. So you do have the uh, you got a fullback. Two receivers like, out so. wide, running back in a pistol, fullback. Looks like he's starting to motion across. Yep. It's just their flavor of what we like to do. Not to say we invented it. It's just everybody's got their spin on it. This is pretty much the meta of spread offense nowadays with the three guys out wide, fullback, running back. Motion him across. Just a little in- run, fills. Yeah. Some kind of zone action. Look like inside. Um, apparently Hoover was living in the backfield early in the game. I was going to say, it's interesting from the final score like they had. Yeah. Little counter action. Looks like the slot's starting to go out on a bubble type RPO, RPO, which that quarterback looks like he's already pulling to throw. The same formation. Nope, and hands he it hands off. it off. And he reads it well done. Yeah. Or at least disguises it. So just stuff we like to do. Um, 
you know, it's not in our defense as we've seen before, just a slightly different presentation to get there. I really hope that this wasn't just absolutely horrendous for our audio-only crowd. Yeah. But, you know, go watch the YouTubes. We've done plenty of audio-only <laughs> up until this, so. Yeah. Watch the YouTubes, get to see some film on them. You know, if you can't make it to the Booster Club on Monday nights, or if you don't want to anymore. Uh, That's pretty much all we got for Mansfield. Yeah, I mean, I'll just touch over their defense really quick. We we watched, we talked about their defense, but their personnel. I mean, like, this, like I said, their defensive line, they go... 220, 240, 215. So they're not huge. Um, Those are good size linebackers. Yeah, really good size linebackers. The issue is their linebackers are bigger. Um, they have, they oh. have like in general, they have really good size on their team. Their offensive line's big. They have height everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, their linebackers are huge. I mean, they're big. They have big linebackers. But their defensive line is a little bit lacking uh, in the size. They have one player. Uh, Ricky Mills, 5'11", 220. He's their best defense lineman. Uh, nose tackles, one that's 240. The other defensive ends, 215, and nothing to write home about. Linebackers, though, uh, 6'5", 225. 6'2", 240. 5'10", 215. 6'1", 210. Uh, 6'1", 210 is their OB. Jack, okay. Their Jack backer. Yeah. Um struggles with blocks gets blocks gets blocked uh they have a few players him uh their obi and their sam uh six five two twenty five uh kind of the same idea with him he's not the best at, in the run game mm-hmm. but he blitzes really well him and the jack both blitz well they don't blitz super often but when they do but they, they do when good. they do they're good at it um but they're not amazing in the run game. Hmm. Or at least they haven't shown that they're amazing in the run game so far. So normally when you're blitzing, you're... The two middle linebackers are pretty good. Okay. And they have the size to match. Normally when you're blitzing, you there's run blitzes and stuff. But I guess if you're saying a guy blitzes well, then it's more against... I mean, I would say you're watching film of them blitzing against pass plays. Like maybe they only really like to blitz on pass plays. Yeah. Where you can... They, they're blitzing from depth. They can kind of read the blocks of the offensive yeah. lineman a little bit, find that little hole that's there, get skinny through mm-hmm. it, and make a play. Yeah, I mean, you could have really good timing with the snap. You mm-hmm. could come from a good spot. You could disguise it well, have a great angle, um, have the speed or technique to get around a blocker. So, I um, mean, they can definitely be better at blitzing than other people, and that's that's it's noted that that's what they're good at. So, uh, secondary is their bread and butter. Like you've seen, they'll move people around. They'll sky stuff. They'll press. They'll play off. Mm-hmm. One high, two high. Um, Amar Davis is their star safety. Their other safety is has good speed, physical, good tackler. Both their corners are good. Um, one of them has a offer to Kentucky, like I said. The other one is really good at press. So, I mean, they're physical guys. They'll get up there and they'll get in your face. Um, but it also seems like they have... They, they mesh well together where they can go out there and run different coverages. They can disguise stuff. Um, you know, for them to go up and fake press and bail or roll into stuff, like, they can get out and move around, and that that's the strength of their defense right there. So, I mean, I'd look for us to try to run against them. Yeah. For sure. But at the same time, like, look for what kind of pass concepts we do against them. Um, just because if they do press, if they do play man, that's going to be different than a team that plays a lot of too high. So. Mm-hmm. So one thing to note is they have the corners denoted field corner and boundary corner. Uh, That's something you do in when you're in a lot of too high like that. If you have pretty even corners, you can keep them left side and right side. Mm -hmm. There's no real discernible talent gap there. Then you want to save the corners legs from having to run to flip the strength of the defense. If you have a dude that's a dude, you want to tuck him into the boundary in especially in like quarters type systems because most of your trips checks end up with that guy just having to play man on the X receiver, yeah. the single receiver, which is usually your offense's best weapon. And that's their uh, Kentucky offer guy. He's the boundary corner. He's got yeah. I mean, he's six three one ninety five. Mm-hmm. So he's one of those like new aged long big corners. Um, SEC offer, and he's their boundary corner. 
So the other side of that coin is usually if you have a really bad corner, then you want to throw him in the field and try and hide him there because all he really has to do is co- uh, cover deep. Yeah. And a lot of quarterbacks are hanging those throws high. You know, not really – a high school, your average high school quarterback. It's a further throw, you have more time. You can see more in front of you. Is yeah. you have other defenders out there with you. So, however, the fact that he's bolded on this roster here tells me he's you know nothing to laugh at. He so it wasn't the Kentucky offer. No, that it, did it for you. It was the bold ink it, on the paper. No, it was the bold ink on the field corner that tells me he's not trash. Uh-oh. So he's not out that there guy, just yeah. Be, yeah. So both corners can be a bit of a matchup nightmare. Let's see. Their their secondary is good. If Banks were to have a statement game, this would be it. I mean, yeah, this was, I mean, I'd say toughest secondary. I know Moore. I mean, Moore is good, of course, and they moved a lot of things around Mm -hmm. to make it tough on us. Um, Talent-wise, this is going to be the – Best yeah, secondary. We've I mean, played. they're 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 good. We'll see. Yeah, yeah I don't I don't want to just. I think I already said it, but I don't want to just blank and you know, Anoint blanket them. statement. Yeah, yeah. That they're the best secondary we've seen so far. But um, this is the best. This might be the best secondary in the three weeks of this yeah. young season. You know, <laughs> between them and Moeller, yeah. I mean, <laughs> really one one yeah. of the two. So, all right. So uh, that's about all we got for Mansfield. You want to get into, we haven't really got the chance to do it yet because of the timing of us recording shows, but look into this, some local spreads and, Ooh. you know, see what we got going on for Maslin. Sure. We can, uh... This is kind of a bit that we started last year right before I went and played in the sand for six months. Just going to rattle off some local spreads. I'll just blind pick them, not knowing anything about any other football teams around us, and then we'll round that out with me guessing the Maslin spread. Okay, so it uh, includes some college spreads. Okay. Just so you know. Um, Glenville at Avon. Avon's 22-point favorites. 22-point favorites? Yes. My, how the mighty have fallen. Um, yeah. Avon <sighs> strikes me as a team that's a bunch of you know smart, heady players, workout rats, might have some deceptive speed on there. I'm bet I'm betting a lot of coaches' sons. Yeah. Glenville, generally known for having a lot of athletes and just not as many anymore. They got cracked down on. Yeah. The Ted Ginn Academy finally got cracked down on, and I'll take Avon in the points. Avon's good. They, they usually make it to the final four. Or am I thinking Avon? Depending on what, depending on what region. I mean, Avon, yeah. Avon Lake, they're both. Good. I think Avon is the one this year. Um, oh, I'll take Avon in the points. All right. Um, Northwest at home, minus 13 against Louisville. Northwest. Are they the Indians? Yeah. Remark's coaching there now, right? For now. Yeah, I think he is. And what did you say they, they were, minus 13? 13, 13 oh. against Louisville. Oh, against Louisville. Another, another team full of uh, – Bunch of, you know, yeah, just gym rats, just real tough, gritty guys. Scrappy players. Um, You know what? Give me a remark to cover. Jackson minus four at Boardman. I don't know. What's Boardman's record? I don't know. That doesn't have records on here. <sighs> That'd make it too easy. I need you to come in here with, like, just records. That's all I want. No. Nah. Jackson minus too four much against Boardman. I don't know anything about Boardman. But you know what? Jackson got beat up last week. Who'd they play? Last week, was it Mayfield? Hold on. I have that one. It's in there somewhere. Yeah, Jackson was 17-point favorites and lost by 38 to Mayfield. Oh, give me Boardman. Don't know anything about him, but I got to start picking some dogs here. Yeah, you can't pick. You can't go all chalk. Yeah, you can't just. Wouldn't be all fun. You don't even have money on the lines. So. <laughs> uh, all right, here's one for you. Fitch, minus 28 at home against Glen Oak. <laughs> um, oh, boy. I think that was my initial reaction, and then after I stopped and thought about it for a sec. You know what? Fitch really brought it to McKinley last week in the first half. 
but it seemed like they pumped the brakes just from looking at the box score because I have no idea about it otherwise. Also in the box score, um, one really like beyond impressive thing McKinley did, I have no idea how they did it. They were four for three on fourth down. 133% conversion. Yeah, well, if you drop the third one, you get to run a first. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know what? Give me and Glen Oak managed to sneak that score in in the end. Give me Glen Oak to cover. I'm taking Fitch. I hate you. I'm taking Fitch. I think we showed enough last week mm-hmm. that Fitch will be able to go in there and at least have somewhat of a game plan at what Glen Oak's weaknesses are. And I think it's their offensive line against any form of pressure whatsoever. And, um, I mean, that's definitely <laughs> a big aspect of it. Yeah. I think Fitch is a smart enough team and apparently a good enough team uh, beat up on McKinley last week that they're going to see what we did. And I think it's going to be tough for Glen Oak to mm-hmm. get but points. But does Fitch on, have you know. the talent that we do? Do they have the front seven that we do? No, I don't think so, but I think they're a smart enough team that there should be a recipe in there to where we're just going to send an extra guy and make the quarterback make throws. Glenno covers next. Okay. I mean, it's very possible. Lake 29, home against Akron East. Oh, my God. These Akron directional schools. I, yeah, I keep I forgetting they're a thing. Get, yeah, I can't pick it. It's going to eventually I, just I can't be pick Akron. a directional school. It's just going to be Akron eventually. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, 29 points. Lake is trending upwards right now. It's at home. Maybe another statement game for him. Give me, like, Perry minus 24 at Euclid. Has Euclid done anything of I note? I don't know. Apparently not. They're 24-point dogs at home to Perry. Oh, Perry's going to Euclid. Yeah, it's at Euclid. You know what? Perry just let the entire nation down. Uh <laughs> Losing to Canada like they did. Yeah, at least it wasn't televised, huh? Yeah. It's... None of those games are televised. What was the point of it? I, I don't know. But they're coming off a statement loss for the... It's a good game, though. No, it... Well, I'm sorry. A statement win for Canada. Yeah. They really need to start proving that they're not absolute dumpster juice like i want to call them right now for losing to a team with a leaf on their flag minus 24 give me parrying the points dublin kaufman at mckinley mckinley minus 19 mckinley just got absolutely throttled they're going to do everything they can to run up that scoreboard as much as they can mckinley in the points uh skip that one kent at Washington. Oh, God. Washington minus 23. Kent has a sneaky good offense. Yeah, I'm taking Washington. Is Washington ranked going into the season? I doubt it. If they, cross, if they were, I think it's more than 23. That cross-country travel really does suck. I But Washington hasn't done anything since they got throttled by Bama in the college football playoffs. So, give me Kent to cover. Oregon at Georgia. Oh, God. Georgia. Georgia. I don't care what the spread is. Give me Georgia. It's 17 and a half. Georgia. Utah, minus three at Florida. Wow. Is Florida that down bad? They have a good quarterback. Give me Florida. I think I'm also going to go with Florida. You said Utah's playing at Florida, right? Yeah. Yeah, give me Florida. They're not Utah's not going to be used to that humidity. You know, they say playing at altitude in Denver's bad. Nah, just playing that 110 percent swamp. Cincy at Arkansas. Arkansas minus six. <sighs> I know Brett Bielema is not there anymore and hasn't been there for a while, but just the image of him coaching at Arkansas, I can't do it. Give me Fickle. I think I might go Arkansas. I don't know who Cincinnati's quarterback is. I don't know anything about Cincy besides the fact that they lost most of their starters and Fickle's still the coach. So, give me Cincy. <laughs> There's a recipe. Uh, Colorado State at Michigan. Michigan 31. Hey. 
Ugh. Michigan's supposed to be pretty good again. They return their quarterback? Shrug. Great for the podcast. I, I don't know. I know they lost most of the front, but at my 31? That's quite... Michigan to cover. I think so, too. Uh, Ohio State, 17 and a half. Notre Dame. OH. Yeah, I agree. What do you think the Madison spread is? Uh, Madison against Mansfield. Mansfield throttled their teams. Madison coming it's in. It's not one what one. I expected, I'll tell you that. Really? Uh, I don't know. Mass- kind of caught me off guard. I know this is technically a home game for Mansfield, but we have had so many playoff games in that stadium in recent history that it might as well be a home game for us, too. Maslin minus 17 and a half. Oh, really close. What do we got? 16. Wow. I didn't think it was going to be that high. I didn't think it was going to be that close. I would. My first instinct was like Maslin minus 24. Really? Yeah. I didn't think they were going to give us... See, the more that I've watched Mansfield, I think they're not as tough as it initially seemed. Mm-hmm. So I thought we were going to get benefit of the doubt just for being Maslin compared to Mansfield. Yeah. But I didn't think it was going to be that big of a spread. No, I thought I, was... I thought it would be closer than that. I mean, they Mansfield's beat up on a couple... Yeah. Not great teams, but I mean they just destroyed Hoover. It's not I mean it's not like Hoover's a nobody. Yeah, so like Nor- I- Norwalk is that who it was? I was looking at some of their highlights. Yeah, they're not they're not amazing, right? They are just bouncing off of Mansfield kids. But Hoover's not horrible. We destroyed Hoover two years ago with probably the worst masculine team since we've like been on this recent run. And they had a much better team then than I assume they do now. They're not a cakewalk. I'm not saying they're a cakewalk. That's the whole, that's my whole point. So they destroyed Hoover, who's not a cakewalk. Yeah, Glen Oak was a Glen Oak was a cakewalk, and we shut it down. I think we're probably gonna pour it on them a little bit, make a bit of a statement ourselves. I I think their secondary is a strong suit, though which would make me think it would be a lower scoring game. More running clock, um, less shot plays. That's I fine think when Trell's popping off for 12 yards yeah, pop. No, I think you can still dominate them with it just being a lower scoring game than that. But what was it again? All right, 16. Minus 16, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's two and a field goal. Nah, I like Maslin. Oh, you give me a... I think I like Maslin to cover. I just think I was caught off guard by it being that much. You can mass minus 24. I'm going to hammer that. Yeah. Not with real money. So if anybody comes up to offer me that, I'm going to say no. Because <laughs> I don't bet. Much less in high school sports, you degenerates. Yeah. But, yeah. No, I like Maslin. I, I like us this week. Gotcha. So with that, do we want to get into some uh, fan questions? Yeah, we don't have as many of them this week, so I got a it couple, should go kind of quick, I think. I got a couple from last week that I wanted to get to that we that they came in after we recorded last week's episode. Yeah, they did. So let me see here. First one, we'll stick with the softball we already talked about beforehand. Why are we sticking with just Wiltro Hartson at running back? He's great, but Freddie Lennox Jr. in there at running back. Rotate them. Keep them guessing who's back there. So the immediate response to that is defenses probably won't play you any different. We From have two, there, we have two different responses, so I'm glad I'll talk my point. But yeah, so I mean, immediate response to me is I, I mean, keeping them guessing is I don't think the defense is going to really change anything based on who's back there, because we, at least in that sense, if we're using both of them, we're going to be using them both the same. Mm-hmm. So if you're using them both the same, the defense is going to treat it the same. So they, it shouldn't really change anything for them. Uh, fresh legs, yeah, of course. But conceptually, I don't think it's going to change much for a defense. Um, I think Will Trell is an exceptional running back, and as long as he's fresh, 
you kind of ride him out, right? Mm-hmm. Of course, you want to keep his legs fresh, so that's when you mix in other people. But I, I think it's – Trell is so good. Um, I, as the season goes on, people are going to remember that. Everybody knows that they just forgot because he missed so much time last year. Trell is that good that I think he is your clear-cut number one. I don't nothing against Lennox at all, um, but I think it has shown already that Trell is your clear-cut number one. Um, with that, Lennox also plays a little bit of defense. Yeah. So another reason to kind of keep his legs more fresh than Trell's. So I think to the strictly to the keeping guessing point, moving Lennox between the backfield and the slot like we've been playing around with. Yep. That's what's going to keep him guessing. Yeah, to, if you use both of them or you move them around, yeah. yes, absolutely. To the rotation point, obviously, you can't just ride one guy into the ground. You you need a rotation in there, get other guys in, keep Trell's legs fresh. To the main point, Will Trell Hartson is the best player on our team. You want him in there early and often and touching the ball as much as the game will allow him to. Yeah. Give Trell the rock, good things happen. Yeah, he's so shifty back there. It's little things that you might not even pick up on from the stands, but he makes plays when there's no play there. He will cut and shuffle and find a hole when there was no hole there. Things get clogged up. He makes a play happen, and he's pretty consistent with that. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to go away from him, that's for sure. All right. Moving on to the next one we got from last week. Why does the playbook seem so limited when there is so much speed and skill on the team? Every play seems to have one option with no outlet slash flexibility. Now, you know I dug into this one. Yeah, I know you did. And I dug in hard. Yeah. And I dug in because, you know how they say there's like no stupid questions? Well, there's aggressively stupid ones. (laughs) Not to say... I think there are... The person asking it is dumb. I think there are somewhat ignorant questions. Yes. And but that's the whole point of the question. Yeah, that's that's fair. Um, not trying to come at you, guy. Not trying to come at anybody. That's also why we don't name drop on here. So I'll be the, I'll be the first one to admit that, like, Hank said he wanted to take this up. And I'm like, yeah, I'd, I'd rather you take it up than I. Because, <laughs> you know, from just sitting in the stands perspective, the, the people that don't track the plays, the people that don't really focus on what formation we line up in every single time you sometimes get lost in different concepts you might see similar things oh i get lost in the sauce for sure i will be the first one to put my hand up and say that well i mean i don't track the plays as much as kind of the results or i might notice like a specific thing but i don't go out there and go oh we just ran drive Mm -hmm. you know i'll say oh we we threw the dig or we threw this crosser, or we've been running a lot of crossers, something like that. Um, but I don't track like, oh, we ran dig. Well, this one was, you know, we're doing posts and wheel. You know, I'll track individual things less than concepts. So from the outside in, it's easy to combine like things, thinking they're all the same. So whereas you might see four, five, six plays, it's really 10, 11, 12 concepts. So. Or, you know, different variations of concepts, et cetera, et cetera. So, from the outside in, it's sometimes hard to track. That's it's not something that I wanted to... T- I didn't want to take on this question from that perspective. So, I'm going to reel back on my aggressiveness a little bit and say I do fully understand most people don't watch the game like my autistic ass does. Yeah, give me another water. Um, I I get that. A lot of people just see, oh, they're just running it deep or, you know, run, handing off the ball inside. There's a million different ways to skin a cat. And unless you truly dive into the minutia of football and understand all the different concepts and stuff, then it is just going to all look like a big mush of the same stuff time and time again. But I went through, I kind of listed off what I remembered from just watching the game and going through some of the highlight stuff, trying to catch anything that I missed. To rattle off some of the different plays we ran, we ran Smash, um, which is just your basic, you know, two-by-two, hitch, corner. We ran, I would 
outs, fade, out, whatever. Number one is running a fade. Number two is running a quick out. We ran curl flat, so same thing except number one's running a curl. Uh, curl wheel, so instead of a flat route, he's like wheeling up once he gets to the sideline. We ran verts from two by two. We ran verts from three by one. We ran drive from two by two, drive from three by one. Uh, da, 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 a lot of snag, double post wheel. A weird one I couldn't quite get a read on where we ran up and trip, lined up in trips, ran the one and two vertical, and the three ran like a 10 yard out. Um, okay. Let me see here. We had. That's your old uh, two minute drill <laughs> play yeah. right there. Ran the fake screen and go, but from four wides. Um, heavy personnel, just double fades. We were in that play action drag with the running back trying to leak out to the. So, quarterback, two running backs, fake run one way, leak the opposite running back out to the flats the other way. We tried to hit it twice, not much sledding on either one. Uh, we ran halfback screen and a tunnel screen to a wide receiver. For the RPO stuff, we had that now screen we've been running, we had the bubble. Run concepts, power, counter F, inside zone, mid zone, outside zone, split zone, which is like the line still doing the same thing, except your fullback, he's lining up play side and scraping across to kick out the backside end. And a little G wrap. And I know I just spit out a bunch of gobbledygook for most people, but I tried to bucket them in what you're doing to attack a defense. So there's, like I said, there's different ways to skin a cat. There's different ways that passing concepts try to influence a defense. Most of it's like zone beaters. So you think your classic smash concept with your outside hitch, your inside corner. You're trying to high-low that flat defender. You're trying to make them wrong. Whether it be like your roll-down safety, your outside linebacker in a classic cover three, or a corner sitting in like a cover two. All the quarterback's doing is reading him, throwing where he's not going. With that, um, same thing with the vert and the out, with the curl, and without really knowing any better, I would say you're almost trying to do the same thing with that two verts and the out from three. Um, That's like a classic outside vertical stretch on the defense of that defender. And everything except that trips look... It was all two by two. So quarterback is to walk up to the line, pick what side he likes, and then read it from there. Uh, your horizontal stretch is would be your classic two by two verts versus cover three. You're trying to stretch that middle field defender. Whichever way he goes side to side, you throw opposite him. And kind of same basic concept with the three by one. With drive... Out of two by two and three by one, it's more of a full field read. Um, everything except the molar game, we would get the back out as well, trying to really stretch that entire field. Quarterback reads it. You can read it high to low, low to high. So you look for your dig, then your drive, then your back, or your drive and your dig. Maybe the post peak, peak and outside route. <sighs> Uh, da, 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 da. snag. So that's we only ran it out of trips. You got your outside guy running like a slant stop. Your number two running like a wide fade. Your number three running a flat route. So you're getting that horizontal stretch of the flat defender with the snag route and the flat, and you're getting a high low stretch with the flat and the vert. Creates a two-way stretch with three different guys. That turns into your classic triangle read, which is your foundation of the entire West Coast passing offense. So, good to see. So, what was that? One, two, three, four. Like, four different ways to attack a defense there. Play action with the flat drag. Um, Got some matchup stuff, too. So, there was one go ball we threw banks on the backside of trips that really threw me for a loop. 
because I'm watching the trip side. It was I think it was an obvious passing situation. That's why I was watching out there, and those three were on snag, and I looked down, and we threw a go ball to Banks. Normally on the backside, you're on like a slant as your classic man beater because the quarterback can walk up, see uh, if it's zone, work the snag. If it's uh, man, just work the slant. Should be a pretty easy win for a receiver one-on-one with a slant route, right? Right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I, I mean, for some people, it's just as easy to win a fade, especially depending on the leverage. But So... That's what, and that happened a lot later in the game. I think that was an adjustment we made on the sideline to where we tell him, hey, run the fade instead of the slant. And then in that same way, Slaughter can walk up to the line. Like, okay, do I like my concept look or do I like my matchup with Banks here? He just tossed up to Banks. And then the same concept with the backside single vertical on three-by-ones. The way a lot of teams rotate, like we talked about, to trip – to um, trips formations is you get single coverage backside. Yeah. So you take your guy that's supposed to win the matchup, throw a jump ball to him. Uh, shot plays. We had, you know, fades from heavy personnel, the fake screen and go, the double post wheel that ended up being Slaughter's interception, and the curl wheel. I think we had some stuff in the tank, too, that we didn't call just based on what I've seen our offense run since this whole crew got here. The double post wheel being called is usually your, like, play off of just your classic double post. So I think we had double post in the playbook, and I would have to assume post wheel as well just based on how much we've run that stuff and the fact that we ran against Glen Oak once that they just didn't like those matchups. Our money play that we had to run to death the last however many years with number two running a corner number one running that trail post behind him yeah. and then a lot of times the way we run that is we'll put the backside on like a really skinny post or a fade and if we like that matchup just throw it to him it ends up being two posts that about run into each other every time hey <laughs> watch the highlights they never run into each other <laughs> and then Screens, you got your T screen, your tunnel screen. That's a lot for the line. And as well with your RPOs, most of our run looks, most of our run plays are tagged with the RPOs. So the quarterback, even though it's a run play, he can either throw it outside to the backside on a hitch, throw it out to the bubble or the now screen, whatever we got. Point being, with that very long winded response, was we have a lot of stuff in the playbook, um, a lot of stuff for a sophomore quarterback and a lot of stuff we ran against a very confusing defense. I think a lot of times they were either blitzing or just ending up in a cover three or cover four, which if a team's just going to sit in that vanilla look, it's not hard to pick apart, but just going back to like the smash concept, you're reading the apex, you're reading the curl flat defender. Well, the way they run their defense, you don't know who the curl flat defender is going to be. So you have to wait until the ball is snapped, figure out who's where, and then throw it to them. And with that as well, that takes more time, more time for the pass pro to break down. Like any pass protection will break down. There's two things that are given in any passing play. Coverage will break down, pass pro will break down. Which one's going to happen first? Unfortunately, Moeller had a really good front four, and pass pro lost poor coverage did most of the time. But like we saw in the film earlier, Slaughter could make it work when that happened. So, point being with all of that is we have a fairly deep playbook for a relatively young roster, and I can only imagine it's going to get bigger from here on out. Yeah. So you got to that? Yeah, I mean, when you break it down like that, it's kind of what you would expect to hear. So, um, I think that is maybe the correct answer to the question Mm -hmm. uh with that i still fall back on most people in the stands aren't going to pick up on all of that so that's fine like you don't need to pick up on it just don't say we don't run a lot of stuff well you might not know any better i mean i like i said when i watch it i don't pick up on how many different things we run you just you catch on the tendencies you're like oh we threw a fade we threw a fade we threw a fade we threw a fade not knowing that that was five different plays 
we just threw the fade aspect of five different plays. Like, yeah. But, like, that's what you see. You see fades. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it's – until somebody tells you different, I don't know, that's what you get. So yeah. Now they've been told different. No. So there you Point go. Point them to this timestamp in the podcast because I do not want to go on that rant again. Yes, you do. You love it. Give me more plays and I'll do it again. <laughs> All right. So more plays. There we go. Uh, is there anything else from last week we missed? Uh, since you're looking at those, not last. I know we have a couple from this week, but yeah, not last week except. Shout out the one dude that agreed with me in my Facebook rant. I saw another thing today in the Maslin virtual sounding board thing. Okay. Just popped across my screen. I was not hunting for this. I promise you. I just noticed that the stadium parking lot is marked out like a football field. Yeah, I saw that too. <laughs> Yeah. Congratulations for noticing that the band's practice pad is also marked out like a field. Did you see that um, somebody put in the comments how long he thought it's been like that? I didn't. I didn't. Then, I couldn't dig. Um, I just screenshot and kept it moving. The the one guy that's in the band, not not in the band, but one. Of the, he's not the director. I think he's the guy that like announces for the band. Oh, classic Masslin voice right there. Yeah, I think he commented underneath of it of exactly how long <laughs> the parking lot's been like that. Oh, hell yeah. It's like, it's like yeah, I think it's been like that for like a decade. And the guy's like, yeah, 32 years, but who's counting? <laughs> but it's like, yeah, the parking lot has been like that, you know, since before the high school was there, probably. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe this about the same time. or Give or take. So, this one... It wasn't a question. It was something I saw on Twitter in a response to the Oak game. Not going to name drop. Yeah, we got it. Go. Not acceptable for D1 caliber athletes. Drop passes and fumbles. Give me a break. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's high school kids and it's going to happen. I guess if I was built like a bag of milk, I'd be mad at the world too. But come on now. Like, let's think before we tweet. The bigger issue is saying it. Yeah, I mean, tweeting it out there, yeah, it's not it's not a great look, that's for sure. Like, obviously, At the same time, we're going to sit here and talk about holding kids accountable, and the coaches are going to talk about holding kids accountable, and the kids are hopefully talking about holding themselves accountable. But, yeah, it's not a, it's not a good look to say that. That's for sure. I mean, you can, there's ways to say it. Like, we call it, yeah, it's tried like to calling the kids out is not That great. is... Oh god, bad look! Like it, that's just shit talking a bunch of kids on Twitter, and like, don't don't do that. Yeah. Please don't. I mean, we do it out of love. Yeah, we're not shit talking. We are analyzing performance. In all honesty, we don't really call out bad performances, pretty much at all. No, we. I mean, like we talked about, um the potential of players right Mm -hmm. but actual like bad play i i don't think we really talk about that at all i'd like to think we've done a pretty good job at not doing that yeah because i mean it happens yeah and and what's the point of saying it right right your best your best player is going to have bad plays Mm -hmm. your worst player is going to have bad plays more of them but like (laughs) what does what does talking about it really you know do that's not even talking about that's just like bitching into the ether yeah. except we can all see the ether and it's there forever yeah like that screenshot is so yeah i, I don't know there's there's just nothing productive from it yeah with that like you know we have said things about hoping players live up to potential like their actual potential not mm-hmm. not the pressure that's on them but like their actual potential what we believe we see from them so if we talk about any specific player it's usually because we believe that they can truly rise above even what we're asking them to do so i would like to believe we have a little more nuanced and informed opinion than whatever the hell a twitter rant gets you yeah i mean not that we need to dwell on this. I just wanted to it's bitch a, about it's that, too. Not a, it's not a great way of saying it, but, like, yeah, fumbles and drop passes are no good. Yeah. It's not great. Just, like, be better with the messaging. Yeah. All right. That's all I wanted to touch on uh, before you get to the meat of them, Mr. Social Media Man. 
All right. I mean, we only have a couple ones this week um, coming out of win. I guess not as many people want to talk about anything. Uh, let's see here. Um, just going to paraphrase, of course. Uh, great show, guys. I live. I listen every week. Hey, awesome. Hey, shout out. Love the insights. See, that's nice to hear because, yeah. like, you know, we try to be insightful. We'll try to, like, break some things down, talk about some stuff. Uh, let's see here. All right, so this one's going to get kind of specific and probably really off base. Go for it. Again, so uh, I know a lot of Maslin fans I hang out with have been questioning for years why on third and six we always seem to be running go routes 40 yards down the field. Um, when you have the likes of Trayvon Morgan, Jaden Ballard, and yeah, I think other really fast guys, you do what they do good, and that's run forty yards down the field really fast pass coverage. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think um, when you have the guys for it, like, our, our percentages historically have been pretty good with yeah. that. So, with that being said, I mean, I, I, there I, are times where I think we have been maybe a little go happy, but I understand running that. You know, six yard hitch on third and three might be the money answer, but at the same time, the defense knows that's that. That's what the defense is going for. And yeah, if so. we're running like Jaden Ballard on a hitch 30 times a game, you are criminally misusing that talent. Yeah. Uh, also, why are we not utilizing the six foot six tight end? So, this one, uh, normally I don't touch DM messages. I let you do that and bring them to the table. For some reason, this one caught my eye. Yeah. And when I saw that, I was like, we have a six foot yeah, six wait, tight end. Yeah, he's a sophomore, so that's probably part of it. Yeah. Um, also, like you talked about, the, having like an actual tight end mm-hmm. isn't something that we've really been using a lot historically. The last couple of years. So this year, yeah, we have been running the shit out of him out there. Mm-hmm. And in fact, uh, what really told me that we're going to be running the hell out of drive this year is the fact that the first time he called it against Moeller, we had him running the dig. Yeah, so, I mean, I think there's potential there. Mm -hmm. Um, It's still, I mean, he's a sophomore player in a system where we really haven't been using that position too much. I I know you can can insert it into some concepts, like like your drive, you said, but, I mean, that's something you probably look forward uh, more. Uh, At the same time, I'm not super familiar with that player like you are, so... I. Uh, no, I have no idea. I just happened to look at the roster and yeah, then I'm, just I mean, I heard about him last night and that was the first I heard about him. And so. just remember when it's like what was it when we were in drive that first time? It was like third and mediumish. We come out and like, okay, you know, tight end set. We're probably not gonna use him on a oh my god, he's running a go route. No, that's a dig route because we got the shallow route coming underneath it. Oh. Uh ball didn't go to him because he got Moeller was clogging up the middle and you know, Freddie came free on the drive. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, that's something I'm looking for in the next couple of years that I think we can, like we talked about with why are we running the go routes on third and whatever, is because I the staff has shown me enough that we know how to use the talent we have. Uh, a six foot six sophomore, I can't imagine, has been six foot six for very long. So maybe it might take him to get used to his body you don't know how much of an actual athlete he is versus just uh bigums out there that didn't like eat too much as a child so he's not as fat so he can't play tackle uh so just look for that in the future see what we do with him see what he can do yeah uh why are we not throwing to trell out of the backfield um so i think i my first look at this yeah is um i mean it's something i'd like to do you know between him and lennox um or from a two-back set i I think that's a it's a dangerous thing that could be done at the same time i think we like him having the extra blocker in there with our pass pro i mean i know you can try to dictate the defense maybe a little bit or if you're doing that enough like maybe you can hold off on some blitzes or um i don't know i think that's something we could get into more so again when i read this question my first instinct was yeah we don't really use him much out of the backfield like in the last you know call it 
slightly more than a season we've actually had him at running back. Yeah. You know, because when he first got here, it took a while to learn the playbook, learn how to be a running back. He kind of came on yep. through the playoff run of the 2020 season. Then 2021 gets hurt, so we didn't really get to utilize him as much, especially with the quarterback we had. It was much more of a run game driven offense. And then. I mean, really, you can scrap the Glen Oak game. We didn't need to do much. But when we did use him out of the backfield in past seasons, we've really only had him running a swing route. And we've, you and I have talked about this before. Like, why why the swing route versus the flat? And yeah, you've said it. You know, you get a guy out there, you get the ball in his hand in space, makes a man miss, and suddenly he's got a bunch of green grass in front of him. I'd like to see a little more flat route stuff as well, really attacking that line of scrimmage more on certain concepts. Like when we ran snag last year, it was out of two by two. So the f- the flat route was a swing by trail, and it didn't really pull the string on the coverage like you'd want it to. Yeah. So if you're going to do stuff like that where it needs to be part of the concept, then, yeah, more attack that line of scrimmage. But if it's just you're leaking them out there, underneath of a double post where the the coverage just all drains with it and suddenly he's got 30 yards of green grass in front of him, then, yeah, I'm fine around the swing. Against Moeller, we didn't send our backs out at all. We didn't run any sort of essentially empty protection, just five-man, uh, you know, no back protection. Because in our base pass protection concepts – especially against Moeller, because you didn't know where that extra pressure was coming from. You need to have that back in there to protect. Um, I'm going to get real nerdy here on pass pro for you. So in your standard drop back pass protection, it's what you would call a half man, half slide. So if you imagine it, you got your five offensive linemen and you're running back. Just say the slide side is going to be the left side. The man side is going to be the right side. Your center, left guard, left tackle are sliding to their gap. They are responsible for anybody that shows up in the gap to their left side. Your right tackle and your right guard are man on. So that's going to be tackles going to be taken on an end. Guard is going to be taken on either a nose or a three tech. That leaves your running back to fill in because you're either going to have that right side A gap or B gap unprotected. So he's going to fill in, scan inside out for a linebacker looking to blitz because the slide side will pick up any uh, blitzing backer naturally just based on it's just who shows up there. When you don't have that running back or extra guy in to protect, then you lose that. So you either need a hot route built in or the quarterback just needs to know if I got pressure coming this way, I got to get rid of the ball. Um, there's certain ways you can leak the back out and keep that six man in. A lot of times we've done it where we keep the fullback in, but then you have to keep them tucked in the gap. You're giving away what side's the slide side, what side's the man side, and that's when defenses can just tee off, send designer blitzes, overwhelm the man side, waste guys on the slide side, and suddenly you're giving up a sack when the defense only rushed four guys and you're keeping six in to protect. Um, it's hard to live in empty protection if that's not something you're going to major in. If you're not Ashland or uh, Green, where that's pretty much the only thing your line's going to do, then you're not going to have all of the different audibles, calls to hand all of the different handle all of the different looks you're going to get from defenses, because there's nothing a defense loves more than when an offense goes empty. What does our defense do 70% of the time on normal downs? Stay back, play base quarters coverage. What does our defense like to do against a team that goes empty? Blitz the fuck out of them. You saw it in the Glen Oak game. We stayed back in coverage the entire time, and then, well, we saw a thing or two we liked with the blitz, but as soon as they went five wide empty, we immediately checked double-A gap pressure, Sack. And if you think I'm like exaggerating on how much shit you need for the line and the quarterback to be able to call the protection correctly, 
one of my nerdier things is I like to collect like NFL playbooks. If I stumble upon them, I find them and just peruse through whatever. The 2016 Patriots offensive playbook went through and just real quick looked at their pass pro stuff. They got like four different types of just standard drop back pass protection. About three to five pages per, per type for everything except empty. Five man. That one they had 11 pages because they had to carry so many checks and that all falls on the quarterback. So not only are you teaching him the passing concept that he's trying to throw, he needs to be able to read the entirety of the defense, tell the offensive line, all five of them, where they need to be to pick up all the different shit a defensive coordinator is going to throw at him. And that's just too much for a goddamn 15-year-old. Point being to that rant is you need to keep him in for protection or just hand him the goddamn ball. All right, good rant. Good rant. Thank you. It's going to be a five-hour podcast. I'm going to get five hours of sleep. <laughs> I'm probably going to get less. Okay. I just don't have time for all of these. Which, Pass Pro is not something I expect a lot of people to know about. Not nearly. I'm not nearly as mad about that as I am about the... Uh, Why does our offense only run two plays? Uh, let's see. Uh, defense was good in the first half. I think they were better than the second. Um, thought it, the defense was improved. Yes. Yes. Uh, Gwenok doesn't have much of a passing game, so I still do have some current concerns about our secondary. I mean, I think that's that's fair. They're young still. I mean, they only have two games under their belt. Mm-hmm. Uh, still got some rotation going on out there. But I think part of the reason we were getting sacks last game is because our coverage held up in the back end. Uh, Can't throw the ball see. if nobody's open. It was a nice crowd. It was, yes. Uh, I don't know if the TIG chant is still a thing anymore, which it's, is sad because you can really rock an opponent with that. It's certainly that, being beat to death by a couple That fans. was kind of a talking point all within itself that we wanted to bring up um, because, I mean, yeah, I, there aren't really any TIG chants successfully uh, because there's so many bad ones. Yeah. If you are chanting TIG the entire game no one's going along with it. You know, it's it's hard to have a good one at a legit time when there's been not an exaggeration of 60 failed TIG chants throughout the game. So I think they need to be timed out correctly. In general, every chant needs to be timed out correctly. I think that's a major mistake. The, the issue is everybody gets so hyped up after a second down stop that they just immediately go into a big defense chant because you got a big third down coming up not realizing that the third down chant will dwindle while there's still 20 seconds left on the play clock <laughs> yeah, you want it to be the loudest as the offense is lining, lining up, up not while they're still in the huddle so uh i think in general that's could be timed out better, but the TIG chance, yeah, they need to be timed out to the point where it's it's a big moment and people are gonna, people are going to join in. It's with the TIG chance. It's a less is more approach, man. Yes. Like if you're tired of all the go balls that we've been throwing the last few years, it's oh God. It's like every down with the TIG. Yeah. It it's too much. Uh. And there's times where you just don't want to, like, you don't want to do it after we just gave up a big play or well, one somebody of just got hurt. You know, you don't want to do it while somebody's hurt. There's timing for it. it. It needs to be. There needs to be a couple of them. Yeah. During big key moments, where people are willing to join in. If people aren't joining in, you're not doing them at the right time. Or so, you're just doing them too much. So stop. Yes. Um, 
because yeah, I I mean I haven't heard one successful TIG chant this year. No, not a one. Like an actual chant, nothing. Haven't heard one. How about we just like go back to the old days and let the cheerleaders actually do what uh, their yeah. name means? I, I mean, so that was better than doing them all the time, <laughs> but the cheerleader <laughs> ones weren't always at the best time either. But yeah, that I mean that would be a, a huge upgrade right now is having it led by the cheerleaders. So. You know, you think you got like that lull before the team runs out onto the field and almost everybody's in the stands. Like, yeah, get it going then. After a big go-ahead touchdown, once we've kicked the extra point, it's, you get that lull between the PAT and the kickoff. Get it going then. I'm thinking that it should pick up. I think in the Moeller game we were behind and then... We we're, were behind. I want to say functionally out of it for most of it so it, it's kind of hard to get a real big chant going while it, yeah. it kind of seems like you're out with glen oak we were up early and then it just you know people think of glen oak as being glen oak the last few years so yeah. they're not as into it from that standpoint they don't feel like they need a chant to help the team so I think as you get into bigger situations throughout the year, you'll you'll start to see it. But it still will only work if you don't beat it to death all game long. So yeah, that's that's our rant. You know, time them out correctly. Yep. Don't do them all game long. Less is more. Absolutely. We need a pitch count on those. I'd, I'd run out of a clicker. Like <laughs> there's too many. Are we getting into Max's question, or are we saving that one for a later time? Because I really like that one. Um, I let, let's save that one for a later date. Maybe we can mention it. Yeah. Let people Ooh, sit like on that. it for a while. Yeah. And then we can collect answers and really think of our own good. Because it is a good question. Hmm. Um, so let's, let me finish this one out real quick. Also, just I only mentioned his name because he's like our biggest fan. Yeah. And I love have that no, man for have that. I have no issue. Um, and also, he just usually replies to the tweets rather yeah. than DMing <laughs> us. So apparently, he doesn't mind having his name out there anyway. Uh, let's see. Tiger O looked better. Yes. Due to the opponent. Also, yes. yes. I, I mean, everything about us doing better last week is going to have that Glen Oak isn't great next to it. That doesn't mean we didn't take leaps and bound strides. You know, we may have. It's just kind of hard to tell since mm. Glen Oak was a lesser opponent. Uh, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention this and move right on, but what's the deal with the play look? Why do we only have four plays? Well, I, so, I, I went on a long rant about that. Yeah, so we hit that. I just wanted to like let it be known that it's multiple people that, that say these kind of things. So uh, is it a coaching thing, personnel thing, or just not needing more plays? I think the Glenn last Lenoc. part of it is, you know, we don't need more plays, yeah. but it's because we have more than people think we do. Uh, let's see. Mansfield quarterback, is he the real deal? I mean, I think we kind of – we talked about him earlier. Is he the real deal? I don't know. I mean, we'll see. I mean, I, yeah. I watched a little bit of stuff on him, not a whole lot. It's it's flashy. I think they might be making a bigger deal. Like I said, the media loves him over there. So mm-hmm. I think they may have hyped him up a little bit more than he has shown so far. Or maybe I'm downplaying it a little bit. I guess we'll see. They have a lot of playmakers. He hey. throws a few good passes. So I think Friday will be a, a real test of just how good he is i mean is he a flashy athletic quarterback or is he like actually a a real deal kind of player because i i don't i don't know yet well if it's anything like last year and for some reason this is less to do with our slightly down secondary last year and more just like the flow of the games he's gonna have a coming out party against us slang it for like 800 yards and we're still gonna come out on top (laughs) a la warren and yeah the warren yeah um, so that's, I mean, that's not all of them, but, um, there's a few things that I think should be brought up on a, on a different podcast than this one. All right. I'll let you back those. Um, but let's get Max's question out there. Yes. So let me grab it here. Oh, uh, let's see. I love Mansfield on the schedule. Yeah. I mean, they're the fourth most played team in our history. Mm-hmm. Haven't played them since 03. Yep. 
so the question is, what would your ideal schedule be every year? So like, what are the 10 opponents that you would like to play? I'll read off Max's, and then I think we're just going to sit on it. Yeah. Um, we'll collect some responses from other fans, get some ideas. We'll try to actually put you know, a decent amount of effort into it mm-hmm. this week to think of exactly how we'd like it broken up. I like Max's answer. So his is week one mentor or a different public powerhouse. Sets the tone for the season. Week two, Glen Oak. Week three, Mansfield. Week four, Warren. So kind of just how we have it um, so far. Steubenville. That is a good... I mean, I like playing Steubenville. Bring him back? Yeah. Fitch? And by bring him back, I mean answer your goddamn phone, <sighs> Reno. Yeah. Uh, Fitch. That's a, another local team we played a bunch. And, I mean, it's a scrappy game. Mm-hmm. It, I mean, we've, we've had success with them, but they're, they're a tough team. Uh, Iggy. Classic. Ashland. Um, explain that one to me. Ashland? Yeah. Besides the fact that Stacy's No. Rose? Who's at the college? <sighs> Owens is at the college. Strike three, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to get there eventually. Uh, I kind of figured it wasn't Paul Brown. It's not Paul Brown. Uh, Owens. Owens, okay. Owens is at Ashland. So I don't... I, I'm going to put my hand up and say I don't get the connection there, why they would be on the schedule besides that reach yeah i mean i don't don't know i don't think at least not recently there's a whole lot of history there um if that was just like a i mean i don't i don't i don't dislike that i think that's one of those like smaller schools that have had success um except for their they're in our division aren't they i don't know um like i I don't dislike it i was just like a very specific kind of like where did it come from Yeah. yeah uh no i think i think that'd be be, I, I'm perfectly fine with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a specific connection to it. But, yeah, I think that that is kind of like a team that I could see us playing, though. A team like Ashland, a team like Worcester, a team like Barberton. Kind of like a local team that isn't, you know, a huge powerhouse kind of thing. But, like, they're local enough that we should be playing every now and then. Yeah. Kind of like that. Uh, week 9 is a cupcake and then week 10 is McKinley. So he kind of wants that soft game. Week 9 going to week 10. So what is your ideal 10-week schedule? Who do you want to play? Um, local teams, powerhouses from across the teams, um, Ak- Akron directional schools. <laughs> do you want to play powerhouses from across the country? Do you want Valdosta to come up here? Give me Bishop Sycamore. Bishop Sycamore, <laughs> all ten weeks. A trade in a McKinley for a <laughs> Bishop Sycamore, ten week season. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think that's an interesting question because everybody has a slightly different view. I mean, do you want to mix in some lesser competition? Do you want a strong schedule all the way throughout? Do you want to front load it, back load it? Week nine, what are you thinking? Do you want a cupcake going into week ten? Do you want something that still prepares you going into the playoffs, going, prepares you going into Week 10? Do you want a team that has maybe a similar style as McKinley so you can prep for both of them? You know, Week 9 can also lead you into Week 10. Or do you want every team in the area to ignore you to the point where you have to schedule a Canadian team for your JV team? Yeah. Do you want to play Canadian team Week 9? Let <laughs> JVs go out there and rest everybody. There, I mean, there's your absolute cupcake, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of different possibilities out there. You know, who's the team that you love to play? Um, where are places you'd like to go? You know, it's not going to be 10 home games. So, Ooh, I didn't even think of that angle. I mean, obviously not all of them are going to be home and homes. Yeah. You know, that's not how it That's not how it works. We're not doing a home and home with Valdosta I, just I, because we're not allowed to. Yeah. But I would um, say your ideal mass on schedule is going to end up with uh, seven s- or eight home games. Probably. Let's I, go seven. I would say you end up with six guaranteed and then three home and homes. Okay. And then obviously. Yeah. I mean, eight. we're, we're on the ballpark. We're yeah. all aware of what mass ones schedules have been in mm-hmm. the past. So maybe you don't like that. Maybe you want to do six away games. I, I don't know. Tell us what you think. You can be wrong, but you can tell us. 
Yeah, I mean that's that's like the number one reason. I was always like fifty fifty on like the Fed. Mm-hmm. J- less about me wanting to play those teams and more about like the fact that they just won't let us. I think that was my bigger gripe was the fact that they just wouldn't let us in the Fed. Not even that I <laughs> want to be in. You it. don't want to be in the club. You're just mad. You're I'm not just mad in. that they won't. Yeah, it's like I'm. Who do you know here? Well, it's the fact that they go out of their way. To prevent us. When I say they, I mean Jackson and McKinley. The last time I got voted on, it was Jackson and McKinley were the two teams that kept us out. So I don't think, I don't know if that was football or for other sports, but I mean, like, we're not in the Fed for, like, we could be in the Fed for other sports besides football. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how many games it really takes up. Like, I don't know how many out of conference basketball games they have. That'd be interesting to look at because they mm. play like 22, 24 regular season basketball games now. Sounds and what right. would the conference be? Would it be 12, 14, 16? I don't know. I mean, it, we play a lot of the teams in those sports anyway. We're just not in their conference, which hurts in some sports like baseball. Being an independent baseball school, you rarely see the other team's best pitchers because they uh, always save their best pitchers for, for conference them. games. So you can go a whole season without seeing aces. Mm-hmm. And then you get to the playoffs, and you have to face some competition you haven't seen. Not to say that you aren't seeing good pitchers, and you will see some teams' aces because it's still the we want to beat Maslin thing. But in general, a lot of these teams will save their best pitchers for conference play. It makes sense for them, right? So, I mean, it's just a little bit different when you're in a conference. Something that we haven't been in in my entire life. I don't know when we stopped being in a conference. Seven. Early 80s, maybe? When did the All-American Conference dissolve? Yeah, I don't know. You like the All-American Diamond stuff. I, but, yeah, I mean, we haven't been in that. And it, it adds a different dynamic going mm-hmm. for conference championships. So, um, But my biggest thing is when I just completely shut down the idea of ever wanting to be in the Fed for football was that it's all home and homes. Uh, and it's like, yeah, it. do I want to have a 5-5? Five and five? I mean, you could schedule some out-of-conference games. But, you know, do I really want to travel to three or four no. Fed schools every single year? Absolutely not. And that's where it's like, ah, uh, yeah, no, nope, never mind. Yeah. No, I'm fine where I'm at. Yeah. <laughs> Independence, not that bad. Yeah. <laughs> it all works out. So, um, but yeah, tell us what your ideal schedule is. What team you'd like to see us face? Uh, what rivalry you'd like to bring back or continue or start a new one with? Yeah. Uh believe that's all we got for questions tonight right yeah it should be all we have total <sighs> how it's long late it is late um it's hot it's hot it's hot in here. well uh we'll call it tonight as this did run a little late both of us at certain points got a little long-winded in our responses i felt my eyes glazing over when we were talking about pitchers yeah but that was like 25 seconds I no, I fully, telling... I fully understand what I was doing too, and, and and I sat here like, oh, this is how he felt. So I get it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, trust me, I understand what was happening. in This dynamic here. All right. So with that, we'll get out of here. We'll see y'all on Mansfield Friday night. Go Tigers! Beat the Tigers! Beat Mansfield. <laughs>